You have a. <laughs> it's yeah. Live now. Are you sure? No, it's not. Okay. Why wasn't it live before? I think we need to really fix this. Uh, is it live right now? What, why? Okay. There's so many infrastructure problems. It was so easy from my office, you know. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to hide this then. Okay, I guess it's live, yeah. I can see it here, but it has started now. It's working. Okay, it's working. Okay, yeah, I think we need to figure out this problem because this shouldn't be that hard. It's amazing we're having so many problems with these computers and you think we're really going to be able to have self-driving cars with all this, <laughs> with all this, I don't know. We're not even handling complexity in a laptop. Yeah. I don't know, sometimes, sometimes uh, maybe we need to take a fundamentally better approach like what we've been discussing in this class, right? It's very hard to believe that uh, we're going to be able to trust our computers to be dependable enough to, I don't know, steer us, to guide us. Anyway, <laughs> I don't want to go into the philosophy of this, but maybe some of you will fix this problem, right? The fundamental trust is broken somehow between the computer and human. And without that, I think it's going to be very hard to have this artificial intelligence. I mean, people have philosophized about this a long time ago, right? Uh, but in a different way. It's not a depend. They don't think of it as a dependability problem. They think of it as a control problem. Okay, AI will come and take over the world and we're not going to be able to control it. I think we don't, we, we first of all, have a dependability problem. We cannot even depend on these computers. Yeah, on top of that, they can take control us, yes, take over us, everything. Okay, anyway, after this debacle, I thought we were going to start right on time and we got delayed for seven minutes and then I started talking about this. So I, I delayed us a little bit more, fine. <laughs> Let's get started now. So yesterday, uh, we ended up at the beginning of this, basically. We, I, we were, I was going to conclude raw hammer and then we're going to jump into in-memory computing today. Does that sound good? So let's conclude Rohammer. If you have any questions on Rohammer, this is a good time to really uh, ask. Well, maybe during this first part of the lecture is a good time to, to ask. But I'm going to generalize a little bit and also talk about some of the learnings from Rohammer. And maybe you'll see, as I said, some other talks on Rohammer uh, of the cutting edge research from probably my students. Okay. Now this is a user error, meaning I didn't put it here. So, <laughs> but that's part of the complexity also, I think. <laughs> Why do I need to connect that component so that this functions right? I guess with Bluetooth, it just works, but it usually doesn't work. Okay, anyway, uh, so let's talk about future memory reliability and security challenges. So I think Rohammer is a good example of a DRAM scaling issue. Uh, retention errors are another example of DRAM scaling issues. So we looked at these different errors, but it's clear that DRAM is becoming less reliable, more vulnerable, and You've already discussed this paper, right? And you've seen this example. So I'm going to go through this quickly. Flash memory is also becoming less reliable. Depending on how things go, I may actually talk about flash memory a little bit toward the end of this lecture. Let's see. Uh, and due to difficulties in DRAM scaling, other problems may also appear, or they may be going unnoticed, right? Some errors may be slipping into the field. Rohammer clearly has been. Uh, maybe retention errors are slipping into the field. Maybe you understand what I mean better right now. Who knows, right? Uh, it may be hard to detect and hard to induce clearly, uh, but if you, if you somehow figure them out and exploit them, maybe, uh, maybe you're also hard to detect as an attacker, right? Uh, maybe readers, writers, I don't know. These are also very hard to uh, see, especially in chips. That, uh, so what we, what we know and what we don't know is very different, right? We clearly know some of the error mechanisms, like read disturb errors, retention errors, sure. What we don't know is what happens when the chip is out in the field in many different conditions, right? So uh, this, this iPhone is, for example, seven, year, seven years old. I don't know what kind of error mechanisms uh, are in place in DRAM, for example, meaning how do, they, how do they evolve over so many years of usage, right? So, that's, uh, so there are some things we don't know, and it's very hard to get that data as well, right? This aging data. And uh, that's why I think it's a bit... Uh, interesting to understand these error mechanisms. If you come up with a good way of figuring out that aging data, that's, 
That would be good to know. I mean, there are artificial ways of getting aging data, right? You can actually accelerate the aging by exposing the chip to higher temperatures, higher voltages, et cetera. But they're artificial ways. They're not, uh, their correspondence to the real ways may not actually be exact. As a result, we may not fully understand it. Okay, but it's good to keep in mind, basically. And these errors can also pose security vulnerabilities. Again, who knows, right? Uh, if, uh, it's very hard to that they cannot, because uh, again, that goes against the creativity of some attacker, right? And I, I will never underestimate the creativity of people who want to try to do something. <laughs> yes. So about what you said regarding the aging data, do you mean that we fundament we don't know how the fundamental DRAM technology ages, or that given an improvement we make to technology, there's a long lead time before we would know how well it worked? Because for sure, there's got to be like data centers out there that are seven years old, and you can just go and analyze the RAM, right? Yeah, yeah, you can you can analyze them, but those are correlational studies, right? They're not. Uh, we we don't uh, we can uh, so we cannot do an easy experiment. You can but uh, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, you cannot do an easy ex controlled experiment where you age DRAM and look at the effects, right? But yes, you can do correlational studies like analyzing data centers, which have been done, uh, but they need to be done more rigorously also perhaps going forward. So we have some idea. I think, for example, uh, uh, people claim that uh, DRAM uh, doesn't have endurance problems, right? I don't know if that's still true in the, in the technology nodes that we're dealing with. Meaning maybe at some point these cells go bad, right, in the field. But we don't know exactly. So I think there's not enough data, basically. Okay. Okay, we've discussed DRAM data retention failure. So I think that's going to be uh, interesting going into the future. And you know these papers. Some of you may be reading those papers. And we've discussed some issues like data pattern dependence and variable retention time. I'm just going to jog your memory on some of these papers. How many people read this paper, by the way? Anybody? Okay, one person. Maybe other people on Zoom that I cannot see. Okay, I would recommend reading this paper. Uh, maybe looking at their slides also because they argue for what we have been arguing, right? And they discussed, for example, refresh uh, and variable retention time, which we've discussed. They also discussed write latencies to increase because of uh, contact resistances between the cell and the trans uh, transistor reducing, increasing significantly. And their resistance is increasing basically all over the place uh, in the uh, It's interesting, I think. And they argue for this intelligent controls, let's say. So how do we keep future memory secure? I think this may be a good brainstorming. But DRAM is one example. Later, we'll look at flash memory. Later, we'll look at emerging technologies like phase change memory, STTRM, RGRAM, memristors, and whatever you may come up with. And these all have different types of error mechanisms, basically. And this is, uh, air, these are error mechanisms that we examine in flash memory, for example. If you're interested, you can look at this paper. I may flash it in the next slide. But you can see that. Uh, there are error types and there are different mitigation mechanisms that are employed and different mitigation mechanisms cover uh, a subset of the error mechanisms in general. They're designed for it. Like if you have a row hammer here uh, in DRAM, it would be uh, DRAM read disturb, but read disturbance exists in flash memory also. As I mentioned, that was part of our inspiration when we're looking at row hammer. But you can see uh, there's, uh, this is the endurance mechanism, PE cycling, programming, erase cycling in flash. Programming errors, when you program data, you get errors actually in flash cell-to-cell -cell interference, data retention, read disturb. So there are similar error mechanisms in different memories, except it's very memory specific, some of them. Uh, and you can see there are many different mitigation mechanisms as well. So I think we need to really be able to understand this whole space really well for all memory technologies. And that's not an easy task also, right? That requires a lot of understanding and data analysis and also developing other mitigation mechanisms perhaps that doesn't exist over here, right? So oh, I, I find this fascinating, basically. This is a chart uh, that's reasonably comprehensive for flash memory at the time it was written. Uh, I think it's still that way, but, uh, but how does the space look for other technologies and how bad are the errors? Okay, so I don't, have, I don't, I don't flash it, but if you're interested, you can read this uh, work. So basically, I think we somehow need to design principled architectures from the very ground up, like hardware, uh, all the way up to the software. Somehow, I think it would be nice to be able to predict and prevent such safety, security, reliability issues, right? Like Rohammer maybe could have been avoidable, right, potentially, uh, if, if people somehow predicted it and maybe took actions. Or maybe they predicted it and they just still didn't take action. We don't know, of course, that one, right? <laughs> but if you could predict it, maybe you could uh, avoid it. I don't know. Uh, I think, uh, again, I don't know all the answers here. This is more speculative. So how can we architect for, uh, for future memory 
uh, I expect future memory for security. Again, when I say security, it's safety and reliability. I don't want to write all of that at the same time. I think we really need to understand first. I don't think we have enough understanding, basically. So uh, it seems like uh, we need to understand these vulnerabilities. We need to model them. We need to be able to have a way of methodically discovering them, if possible, right? It'd always be, it'd always be nice if you could somehow discover them before they happen. And I think uh, there's no other way than uh, understanding real devices and also modeling on top of this, right? And, but I think real device data is not replaceable in my view. Without, without the real device data, we cannot really uh, base ourselves uh, at a good ground, let's say. That's why we've been doing these studies on retention, for example, and uh, row hammer and latency, as you will see later on. I think this builds an understanding of vulnerabilities. But again, modeling is probably the next step. Uh, and we also need to develop reliable metrics, like what error rates are acceptable, for example, uh, what error rates are not acceptable. Of course, this is perhaps work workload dependent, uh, but you need to be careful with this one too. Second is architecting. How do we architect principled architectures with security as key concern? Uh, somehow we need to partition the duties nicely across the stack. Uh, and we cannot give up performance and efficiency on top of this. I think patchability in field is really important somehow. Okay, you, 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 for example, find some error mechanism in the field. How do you fix the problem? If you don't have patchability, then I think it's very difficult, right? That's why we have all these solutions to Rowhammer that are not employable in the field. And we just increase refresh rates because that's, that's, that's the only patchability we have, right? Increasing your refresh rates. Okay. And I think finally, design and test is also important. We need to have design automation and online testing techniques. We've discussed some of them, online testing, for example. Somehow we need to design for security and uh, these testing techniques. If you, for example, keep testing online, uh, over time, you can also collect data, right? Maybe there should be a mechanism where you actually have these devices and you keep collecting reliability data on them over time. I mean, that could also potentially open security holes, right? If someone has access to that data, you need to be careful about this sort of thing. But I think this is also important. Uh, and of course, uh, I think you need to have a good interaction with other system reliability methods, for example, ECC, and uh, maybe other correction methods that you employ in the system. Again, this is a high level slide. I don't have any answers, but I think uh, we need to be more methodical about our approach to hardware security in general and reliability as well. Okay, that's why we've been developing this infrastructure. Hopefully this gives you an example of the mindset. And I th I'm not sure if I showed you uh, this one, but this is our flash-based infrastructure where we have FPGA-based uh, flash controllers and we, where we built a lot of understanding of the flash memory also this way. And this is the paper that I uh, mentioned earlier. If you're interested, you can like prefetch it if you will. <laughs> and there, there are more works on flash memory also that I'm not going to talk about. But similar vulnerabilities also exist in flash memory, actually. This is, uh, it's not, a, uh, this is not the read disturb. There are some programming uh, issues in flash memory that I don't want to get into. But essentially, if, uh, if you somehow can act, get access to the flash translation layer, you can exploit them. But this turns out very difficult to do, basically. In practice, it's very hard compared to Rowhammer. Why? Because Rowhammer induced a bit flip, and that bit, bit flip is immediately visible to your data structures, right? Because it's in main memory. Whereas flash, okay, you induce a bit flip, but that flip, bit flip is not immediately visible to anything. Uh, because flash, there's a flash translation layer, the SSD controller, that does a lot of error correction, for example. Right? So even if you may be able to induce a bit flip using some of the ideas that are in this paper and maybe in other papers, in the end, uh, it's very difficult uh, to get that bit, bit flip to percolate into real software, let's say. Why? Because I think I would argue that these flash memories actually have intelligent controllers already. Well, some sort of intelligence for some definition of intelligence, right? Because they try to, they, di they do try to understand these error mechanisms, the controllers themselves. They do try to correct for them. They have heavy amounts of ECC error correcting codes. Because if you look at the flash technology, it's a technology when you manufacture it, basically many of the bits don't work. DRAM is not like that. Many of the bits actually work in DRAM. Still, they do. Uh, but in flash memory, many of the bits don't work. So the design mindset has always been, oh, I'm going to have a controller that is tightly co-designed with flash memory so that I can correct for these errors with large amounts of ECC, with different kinds of voltage optimization techniques, basically that table that I showed you over. I think DRAM and maybe any other type of memory technology needs that sort of controller also going forward, basically. Okay, I think, uh, I think the takeaway is these errors exist in other technologies also. 
well, some uh, the different kinds of errors exist in other technologies also, but whether or not you can really exploit them for an attack or whether or not they're really reliability issues depend on what the controller does in that technology. Also hard disks, hard disks are another example. I don't have pictures over here, but uh, hard disks also have, let's say reasonably intelligent controllers, right? A lot of error correction methods that, um, that, are, that get employed in hard disks. I don't know how many people have hard disks today. How many people? <laughs> okay. I don't even know if I have hard disks anymore, frankly, at least in, in my personal computers, but quite a few people seem to. Isn't it all SSDs anymore? Yeah. Like magnet, I'm, I'm talking about magnetic hard disks, for example. Okay, some, certainly some, yeah, some, uh, some, some disks you buy, you may use both, right? Both SSD and hard disk, but. That is true. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the cost basically. So if you if you want to have let's say sixteen terabytes, yes, an SSD is going to cost you some amount of money. But yes, I mean certainly uh, if you look at the memory hierarchy, uh, uh, hard disks are much cheaper still compared to SSDs. I'm not sure about their reliability though. This is always actually there are a lot of papers that are written on the reliability of disks versus SSDs. <laughs> uh, but if you really want to store a lot of data, you just you just should use tape, right? <laughs> that's still actually quite <laughs> good in terms of storage some people argue that dna storage is going to be the future for huge amounts of data you encode things in terms of dna but i think that's still out there let's say <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe a long time out maybe maybe for archival storage because uh, reading that dna uh, is going to take a lot of time for example and there may be errors also okay okay yeah, so, so basically, uh, I think flash reliability is interesting. Again, we might have a lecture on this, a 3D NAND flash memory devices. So flash is interesting because uh, flash memory was also uh, having a lot of scaling problems, meaning uh, you, you get, uh, you get, uh, we got into a regime uh, when we got to, let's say, 15 nanometer or so uh, uh, feature size in flash memory, uh, uh, where the, a lot, uh, there was a lot of noise. The errors were very high. Endurance problems were very high. Retention errors were very bad. Redisturb errors became really bad, actually, in flash memory. Uh, so controllers were becoming increasingly complicated to deal with these. But what happened in flash memory is something that's actually uh, maybe like a mini revolution <laughs> in the flash memory space. And people were able to figure out how to stack cells in a three-dimensional manner, as opposed to planar two-dimensional scaling. They were able to basically create another dimension using manufacturing technologies where they, strung, uh, where they had the string in a three-dimensional way. And as a result, scaling became much better that way. So once you go to the third dimension, you can actually scale up as well, right? And, and not just in two dimensions. As a result, uh, the distance between, uh, as a result, two things happened basically. The distance between the cells became larger immediately because you could stack up. You didn't need to pack as much. And also the cells themselves became bigger even though you could actually keep the capacity scaling, density scaling. So even though dense, uh, like capacity was increasing, it was increasing because you could exploit the third dimension. And that actually worked nicely uh, in flash memory. Now it's scaling back in three-dimensional because in, in three-dimensional, how many layers can you add? I think some of the flash memories have 256, maybe even higher right now. I don't know. Don't quote me on it. You can probably, probably find out. Basically 256 layers going up. Uh, probably there's a limit to that in terms of like energy and heating, et cetera. Uh, but now uh, the game changed a little bit, basically. At that point, uh, uh, scaling became better because you had this other dimension. Now you're actually scaling again, reducing the cell size and making things packed. At some point, you're going to hit a scaling wall again, right? So it's, uh, as you keep reducing the size of a cell and putting cells together, uh, I think scaling walls are inevitable. <laughs> And as you push the technology, you'll always get to these issues. No question in my mind about that. But if you're interested, there are some papers that are written here. And this is one of the uh, latest ones. And you can see similar issues, right? Uh, I mean, you don't have to read the paper, but retention loss, for example, is an issue in flash memory, in 3D flash memory also. Process variation, manufacturing variation is an issue, et cetera. OK, I recall that I, we, we used the slide before, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. OK, uh, you had a question also. Oh, OK, <laughs> well, yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, I'll give you other examples. I don't think we use this one. This is another example. So these are bridges. Are we did use this one? Okay, I see. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, I think we already discussed also. Okay, let me let me let me conclude also. But basically, I think my point is uh, we have these critical infrastructures. I think computing is a critical infrastructure, and we can patch it much better. But somehow we're not doing that. It's very interesting to me. <laughs> I mean, clearly you cannot expect bridges to be easily patchable, right? <laughs> That's a bit difficult to do. Uh, I mean, you can argue potentially you could do it also, right? But yeah, it's a lot of huge costs. But patchable computing is much softer, right? Software is clearly soft software, but hardware is also very soft. Meaning, we have we have a lot of techniques for reconfigurability, patchability. We're just not somehow employing them in our systems, which is interesting to think about. Okay, let me conclude. I think uh, let me give you some final thoughts on Roham. Do you guys know about Byzantine failures? Yeah, maybe people who took distributed systems. No, where did you learn about them? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? You just heard about them? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. It's about that, basically. Basically, I think uh, this is actually a slide from uh, uh, Satya, who is a professor at CMU, who was my colleague while I was there. And he learned about Rowhammer when we presented it. And he basically said, oh, I'm going to use this in my class immediately as a third example of Byzantine failures when I teach distributed systems. And he has done a lot of work on distributed systems, the file systems, et cetera. So this is a slide that I borrow from him, as you can see. Basically, uh, Rowhammer type of uh, failures are also known as Byzantine failures. So if you don't know, I'll mention the paper. But basically, Byzantine failures are characterized by undetected erroneous computation. It's opposite of a very fundamental principle or on and dependable computing, right? If you want to be dependable, uh, you, you should fail fast, basically. If you get an error, you should either provide no result or you should basically say, I have an error, I'm not going to continue. Right? That's the pay fail fast principle in dependable computing. If you, have, if you took a, take a course in dependable computing, you will learn these. Has anyone taken a course on dependable computing here? Or does that course exist? Okay, uh, maybe that's, a, that's something that we need to add to the curriculum because that's something I would... Yeah, you think so? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think it's, it's an important course, certainly. Dependable and trustworthy computing, let's say. Well, I think, the, or robust computing, that's another way of thinking about it, yeah. Yeah, but basically, you would learn this as one of the dependable computing principles. And the interesting thing is, I mean, we knew, we knew this from a long time ago. Like, erroneous can be malicious. Right? It's just the intent. The difference is only the intent of the doer. And it's very difficult to detect and confine this sort of Byzantine failures after they happen, of course. Uh, basically, the key is do all you can to avoid them. <laughs> Don't make them happen, basically. And that's what Rohammer is, I think. And this was introduced by Lamport. Have you read this paper also? Yeah, I would recommend reading this paper. I mean, it's a, it's a, a theory-like paper, as you can see. But maybe let's read the abstract, at least. I mean, this is a very fundamental paper by Leslie Lamport. Uh, who, uh, whose other paper we will read actually when we talk about sequential consistency. So he, he did a lot of fundamental work and distributed systems, multiprocessors, et cetera. Uh, but basically he uh, says, okay, reliable computer systems must handle malfunctioning components that give conflicting information to different parts of the system. And he models the situation abstractly in terms of a group of generals of the Byzantine army uh, camped with their troops around an enemy city. Communicating only by messenger, the generals must agree upon a common battle plan. However, one or more of them may be traitors who will try to confuse the others. This is the malicious part, right? Basically, you have a bit flip in this case. You can think of this as a bit flip. And the problem is to find an algorithm to ensure that the loyal generals will reach an agreement. It's shown that using only oral messages, this problem is solvable if and only if more than two-thirds of the generals are loyal. And you can see the proof for that. So a single trader can confound two loyal generals. With unforgeable written messages, the problem is solvable for any number of generals and possible traders. So depending on your assumptions, you can actually solve the problem in uh, different ways. Yeah, I would recommend reading this paper. But basically, you can think of a bit flip uh, turning a, 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 a component in a computing system uh, to a malicious component, let's say. It could be one of your generals over here. And then if you, if you really want to be able to tolerate that bit flip, you really need uh, more than two thirds uh, of your in a distributed system, more than two thirds of your components to be uh, reliable, let's say. I think that's the application here. But for, for more, please read it. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to remind you of this, but let me give you a retrospective. We kind of talked about this, so I'll keep it quick. 
But uh, as I said, I mean, again, uh, this sort of memory errors were also known in the security community, but uh, Rollhammer, because it's inducible by software easily, it introduced a new mindset that has enabled a renewed interest in hardware security attack research. Essentially, real memory chips are vulnerable in a, wide, in a simple and widespread manner, very easy to understand, very easy to exploit manner. I mean, I'm not suggesting the exploits are easy to construct. But fundamentally, the bit flip is very easy to induce. And if you know what you're doing, then yes, they're easy to construct. If you don't know what you're doing, yeah, you need to learn how to really take advantage of it, of course. And this caused real security problems. Essentially, I think the hardware reliability and security connection is now a mainstream discourse in the security community. And this is a slide that I prepared actually a few years ago, in 2018, I think. And I suggested there would be many new row hammer attacks and more to come as row hammer is getting worse. And I think that's true. Uh, and many new row hammer solutions. And I think there will be more to come over here as well. And I think principal designs are going to be more important. Uh, we will talk about more solutions also, but not today. I think uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, as I mentioned in the security community, there, there's a shift of mindset. Now hardware attacks are going to be more important. General purpose hardware is actually fallible in a very widespread way. And its problems are exploitable. And as a result, many system security research actually went into hardware. Uh, so this happened actually in the last time. Mean, people were working on hardware security before also. But in more recent years, after 2014, 15, many systems researchers actually uh, went into examine, hard, examine hardware more in more depth. And they tried to understand the inner workings and vulnerabilities. And I think it's no coincidence that two of the groups that discovered Meltdown and Spectre, uh, which are also hardware attacks, but very different hardware attacks, right? They're, they're exploiting microarchitectural vulnerabilities as opposed to bit flips. Uh, they heavily worked on Rollhammer attacks before, which is interesting, I think. So I think this is actually good uh, to see, but I believe there's more to come. I mean, even after Meltdown and Spectre, this was delivered in 2018, the slide, you see there were a lot of other exploits, right? People, uh, people for, for example, tried to exploit the timing channels uh, that come about because you schedule instructions in different ports uh, of the scheduler, in the instruction scheduler. And that leads to some timing channel leakage. And based on that, you could really figure out what instructions and other processes are executing that's running next to you. Now, this may sound like it's hard to do, and it's hard to do, yes, no question. It's much harder, in fact, in, fact, in my opinion, than uh, something like Rowhammer, for example. But people have shown that you could actually, for example, uh, uh, guess what secret keys uh, that some other process that's executing next to you is manipulating based on the latencies with which it's executing instructions uh, next to you, which you being the malicious user-level program that's executing and timing this other program that's executing next to you. Does that make sense? Hopefully at some level. Of course, you, you may not know exactly how the attack works. And sometimes without doing the attack, it may, it may be very difficult to do, exactly know how the attack works. But we can probably guess that uh, by, by timing what's happening in some other program that's running next to you, because of the information leakage uh, and, and inducing the other program to do something different, uh, you can actually guess uh, the values of the secret key. This is actually an old idea, right? Cache timing attacks were proposed in 1990s. Uh, but it's become much more popular today. Many people looking into it. Okay, so okay, let me conclude this part. I think clearly we've discussed DRM reliability is reducing and reliability issues open up security vulnerabilities that are very hard to defend against. Remember the Byzantine generals problem. Uh, and Roharm is a prime example, and we've discussed this a lot. And I think it's exciting actually uh, because of this implications on the system security research and safety research and reliability research. Uh, and the bad news is Rohammer is getting worse. Good news is we have a lot more to do. And maybe we can use this as a way to actually build fundamentally better systems, right? I think we do need to think uh, the fundamentals of hardware. Basically, we now hopefully are fully aware that hardware is easily fallible, right? It's not something that works as magic, uh, meaning it, doesn't, uh, it, it has errors. And we're developing both attacks and solutions. And hopefully, I think certainly the first two are definitely true, but I think the third one is a bit lacking. We need to develop more principled models and methodologies and solutions. Maybe you guys will come up with some. Okay, so what did not talk, we, uh, we didn't talk about, but I think I'll invite uh, Girai, who's my PhD student, to uh, talk about one solution to Rowhammer, for example, Blockhammer. Is, would that be interesting, you think? This is a cutting edge solution, basically. As far as we know, there is no, well, 
yeah, there may be no better solution to this. Of course, every solution has a strange often uh, upsides and downsides. So better is a relative term, right? Uh, so this is uh, strong in terms of its security guarantees. There's a security proof actually for it. But of course, the area and power overheads could be large still. For example, para is nice. Its security guarantees are not as strong, meaning it's probabilistic. Uh, I mean, you can uh, guarantee security as you, as you increase the probability, of course, to very high, but that becomes less interesting, perhaps. Uh, but here, the security guarantees are deterministic. Uh, and the downside is very high cost compared to para, for example. So maybe, maybe we'll have a good discussion of the space of Rohammer solutions also, because I think it's also fascinating. And we definitely need more solutions, basically. I don't think this is the answer, let's say, going into the future, although this may be part of the answer, just like I think para may be part of the answer. Does that sound good? Okay, and maybe we'll have some of these papers also. Let's see. Okay. Okay, shall we move into... Uh, okay, yeah, now you have a choice as the attendees of this class. <laughs> uh, we can talk about some history of Rove Hammer and... I can tell you about our experiences with the review process and what people thought of the paper and how they rejected it, and how they hated it initially. <laughs> uh, and even after it was published, how they hated it, let's say. I can give you some stories about that, or we can directly jump into processing in memory. <laughs> you want stories? Okay. <laughs> Nobody wants processing in memory. <laughs> okay, let's take a vote. Who wants to talk about the history and the stories? Okay. Who wants to talk about processing in memory? <laughs> okay. Well, I think there's quite a few actually, <laughs> but I think you lose. <laughs> yeah, I, thought, I saw more hands. Some people didn't vote, but they're, they're the TAs. Yeah, they should not vote. <laughs> they should not bias the system. <laughs> okay, so let me give you some history. I'll try to, I mean, yeah, I can talk a lot about this. So I'll try to keep it short, but, but I think it's important to see this history also because uh, it's important to see how people react to something that either they don't expect uh, or they think it's not a problem. <laughs> and, and you will see maybe both of them here. So, I mean, we've discussed this, right? Clearly, uh, Rohammer led to a large body of work today in security attacks, mitigation, solutions, analysis. And I think there will be more, actually, because we, we are also working on it. And I know what's coming next. And I know uh, what people are working on also. I mean, clearly, in Micro 2021, uh, there are multiple papers, and clearly there have been many uh, papers in the top venues on 2020 and 2021. But it was initially dismissed by some reviewers. It was rejected from one conference, so it was not as unlucky as some papers. Some papers get rejected 10 times, for example, before they get accepted. Yes, if you're going to do research, don't be <laughs> upset about this. Uh, but it was rejected first. I'm, let me give you the reasoning. So this is the reviews we received uh, from the micro conference. So it could have been published one year earlier, technically. Uh, uh, in fact, we uh, did the research, as I said, we started the research in 2011 with Intel, right? Uh, and then uh, we built the infrastructure together and we actually did the studies and we actually had uh, submitted the paper, uh, I think in 2013, May. Yeah, you can see that actually, 31st May, 2013, right? So I have a record of it. <laughs> but uh, you can see that uh, you get six reviews. This is a conference review process. How many people are doing research here? Okay, some people. How many people are interested in doing research at some point? Like publishing papers, et cetera. Okay, that's good. Yeah, you may see something like this in the future that basically you submit a paper, you think it's great, and you get this review that basically says, oh, what are you doing? This is useless. <laughs> okay, so you can see that some people actually liked it. Five, four means it's, they liked it. One, two, one, two means they don't like it, basically. They don't want to. Yes. Oh, overall merit. Basically, uh, the reviewer basically in the end says, this is what I think the paper is. It should be, it won me a strong reject. I don't want to see it at all. Don't come to me again. Five means, okay, I think five, in this case, five, it depends on the scale, of course. I think five is a good one. Maybe the top scale was five here. I don't remember, frankly. But five means I want to see this paper. So it's a scale. And don't, uh, I mean, ignore this part. This is novelty, writing quality, reviewer expertise according to, of course, their own evaluation of expertise, right? Uh, and, and the overall merits is what really matters in the end. Let's say saying, I want to see this paper, I don't want to see this paper. And one and two are not good, basically. <laughs> you don't want to receive one and two if you're researchers. But if you're doing, I think, uh, maybe forward-looking research that doesn't get accepted immediately, you can get one and two easily. <laughs> that doesn't mean that the research is bad, I will actually also. Okay. 
Okay, so let's take a look at the reasons. Uh, so this is the first reviewer who strongly wanted to reject it, basically. Uh, so strengths, many results and observations. And by the way, I should say that the paper did not change significantly between the two uh, conferences. <laughs> so we didn't magically add uh, completely uh, new results or new insights. We wrote it better. We uh, improved the results somewhere. So you'll see the two sets of reviews. But this is interesting. Whereas the short disturbance may happen in a DRM array, the authors, authors don't show it can be an issue in realistic DRM usage scenario, meaning real applications. I think, uh, I mean, this is true, and we still have not shown it. I don't think anyone has shown any evidence showing that row hammer happens in uh, a real application. We discussed this last time. There's some evidence that we have seen, but we have not published and cannot publish, that uh, some applications actually see these row hammer errors when they're executing. It's a very small fraction of applications. Uh, and uh, the kind of application is basically, you have a heavy, heavily multi-threaded application and the many threads are basically accessing, trying to access the same row and that row or cache block. And that cache block is not cached. Why is it not cached? Because it's an uncacheable lock, for example, that is kept in memory. And this happens in some extreme scenarios uh, in a Java virtual machine, let's say. And this can happen basically, right? <laughs> Uh, so basically, uh, many threads are accessing the same row, and uh, uh, caches are ineffective, let's say. Because you, you may have some uncacheable data, right? You want to access directly in memory. Because you don't want to deal with cache coherence overhead, for example. You see? <laughs> because if, if, you, if you actually cache all of them, you have the ping-ponging overhead across cache coherence. If you actually keep it in memory, now you may have a row hammer problem. But you wouldn't expect a row hammer problem, clearly, right? Yes? Exactly, exactly. So that's another thing that I wasn't going to talk about, but now that you mentioned that, yes, it could also happen with anything that uh, bypasses the caches, basically. Yes. I think I must be misunderstanding the complaint. Huh? Is the reviewer suggesting in a um, non-malicious application? Exactly, in a non-malicious application, basically. But we don't care about that in research or, or in security, right? Like, yeah, yeah, we but care about the malicious. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, basically, I think it's the mindset of the reviewer. The reviewer thinks it has to happen only here, and I don't care about the entire world where it might happen. So I think the reviewer is basically closed-minded here, I would argue. They're not considering uh, the importance of some other place where this could be important. They're just saying, okay, if it doesn't happen in a real application, I don't care. <laughs> You know, well, uh, actually, you'll see our response also. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, actually, you can see how strongly minded their viewers can be, right? This is a strong reject, basically. And basically, they say, I found the paper is well written, the topic is interesting, relevant. I'm not completely convinced it's going to be an issue in a real, realistic DRM user scenario, main memory with caches, but we have, uh, we have the attack example, right? We showed uh, the real program, actually. Yeah, basically, overall, the work uh, presented, the experimentation, the results are not enough to justify claim that disturbance may be an issue for future systems and that microarchitectural solutions are required. <laughs> it's, it's good to see it as eight years after, right? <laughs> not, not, I really encourage the authors to address this issue, to run a new set of experiments. If the results are positive, the work is great and will be easily accepted in a top notch conference. Test scenario in the paper, which is real, but it's a malicious application, right? Open, read, close, zero, many times that is used to create disturbance is not likely to show up in a realistic usage scenario. So basically they dismiss this, uh, a whole area of security, let's say. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the reasons why the paper got rejected. Basically, this is, this is our answer. Uh, malicious workloads and pathological access parents can bypass trash to cache and access the same DRM row a very large number of times. While these workloads may not be common, they're just as real. <laughs> Somebody can construct them so they're real, right? So they work, uh, the reviewers claiming that they're not real. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is another, uh, uh, this is reviewer A. Uh, they demand something like this, basically. Uh, this is something that is not actually, uh, uh, as, as an expert, they need to know better, <laughs> perhaps. But basically, to make sure that correct information and messages are given to the research committee, it would be good if the conclusions drawn in the paper were verified with the actual, actual DRM manufacturers, although I see that can be difficult to do. Yeah, blah, 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 basically. Give more information about the DRM. This should, probably should not be a reason to reject the paper, right? But, but you see, this DRM manufacturers didn't even want to talk about it. We actually, 
uh, release this paper to Samsung and they didn't want to talk about it at that time. <laughs> they got the paper copy much before it was accepted, basically. <laughs> anyway, okay, let's look at another year. So I think this gives you uh, some mindset of their years. I will also have some recommendations for viewers. But you can see another interesting thing over here. This is an excellent test, me test methodology paper, but there is no microarchitectural or architectural content. Well, we've had some solutions, right, that are microarchitectural or architectural. So basically, I think this is the, another closed minded viewer. This is my world. Don't disturb my world. <laughs> yes. Um, was this because the conference that you were submitting to sort of like, like had like the implicit rule where all the papers like had to include microarchitectural content? No, no, I think this is a relatively broad conference. I mean, it's called micro, but yeah, the, uh, it's, it's all, it's, it has issues about reliability, circuit architecture interaction, many, many things basically. In 2021, we have two Rohammer papers at micro. It's really about the mindset basically. And I mean, you can also get this view perhaps right now, but I think Rohammer has proven it's, it's not going to be, <laughs> they cannot really directly say this perhaps right at this point. Okay, basically, uh, you can read this. My primary concern uh, is that the paper doesn't have microarchitecture content and may not spur on future work. Okay, so these are all speculative things, right? If you if you think about it, they're not really they're not really finding any flaw with the work. It's really oh, I don't want to see it <laughs> because I, it, it doesn't satisfy my taste. Let's say. Okay, and you can see. I mean, these are uh, this is actually interesting. Basically, this person summarized uh, summarized. It can be summarized as leave it to the DRM vendors. Don't disturb the research community with this. This is a terrible mindset, actually. This is, this is perhaps the most malicious mindset in a review. Yes. Uh, can you press the button? I couldn't hear very well. Are there re reviewers uh, part of a big company or something like that? Oh, we don't know. I mean, they're, uh, to us, they're anonymous. They could be. And I think, so. I suspect some of them may be. I don't know. It's hard for me to tell, right? I mean, this could be, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, basically you can see that uh, this is an extremely well-written analysis of DRM behavior and the authors are to be commended on establishing a robust and flexible characterization platform and methodology. That being said, disturbers have occurred repeatedly over the course of DRM history, which the authors acknowledge. History has shown that particular disturbances and in particular hammer errors are short-lived and quickly sold by DRM manufacturers. Now look at the context today, right? <laughs> Uh, historically, once these types uh, of errors occur at a particular lithography node DRM density, they must be sold by DRM manufacturers because even if a solution for a systemic problem could be asserted for particular markets, blah, blah, there will always be significant DRM chip volume in single piece applications where complex architectural solutions aren't an option. So you can you see how speculative this is, right? This, is, this has nothing to do with the paper, in a sense. I think this is really terrible. <laughs> but I mean, I don't want to discourage you from going into research, but uh, know that you will have to deal with this stuff because unfortunately we're, we're not in a great state right now. And I think maybe this is human nature. I think that's true everywhere in the world today, not just in research. Yes, please. I, I know he says like to leave it to the manufacturers and that it's not a research uh -huh. like conference type thing topic, but isn't it like impossible? Like vendors don't necessarily do things unless the researchers find exactly yeah. solutions to it. They don't, do the full research themselves, even in their research departments. Exactly, yeah. So isn't it like a really dangerous way of reason of rejecting a paper to say, just let it them do it, even though you know if you don't start it, they will never do it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, if it's, if it's not exposed, who knows if they will do it or not do it, right? So yeah, this is a very dangerous. Uh, maybe this is the worst review, I would say. Uh, and this is an expert in the area. I mean, they might be from a DRM manufacturer. We don't know. <laughs> That's possible. They may have a conflict of interest, frankly. But we don't know, that's not under uh, the author's control. Usually the way their reviews are done is, authors are not known to their reviewers and reviewers are not known to the authors in this particular conference, basically. Uh, yes, please. Uh, who are the reviewers? Are they all uh, attendees of the conference? Or not necessarily, I mean, it could be, uh, basically there's usually a committee, it's called a program committee and there's a program chair. Program chair assigns the uh, papers to uh, the committee, but it could be an external reviewer also outside of the committee whose opinion is sought. Actually, they can be anyone. <laughs> I mean, this person claims that they're an expert in the area, as you can see, right? Yes, please. Don't you have to tell if you have a, a conflict of interest? <laughs> Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> Who, so, okay, there's an accountability issue also, right? Maybe they have a conflict of interest. Maybe they don't see it as a conflict of interest. This is also a fuzzy area, right? 
maybe they see themselves as an expert in DRAM and they have to vet everything that goes through DRAM. And if they have another good mindset, they basically are going to kill the paper. I like this last sentence, maybe. The authors have identified a contemporary disturbed sensitivity in DRAMs, but as non-technologists, he claims, our community can generally only observe, not correct such problems. This is actually a very regressive, let's say, <laughs> uh, uh, mindset. Yes, please. Uh, he mentions also there that history has shown that something, something in particular, hammer errors are short-lived. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's not been shown before extensively, right? So did he get his literature wrong or? So, okay, uh, let me put it this way. I mean, certainly there's the DRAM circuit literature that shows that uh, there are hammering patterns that can lead to errors. And people know this disturbance problems, right? That's no question about that. And we mentioned that in the paper also, they say, which the authors acknowledge, right? You basically cite all the literature in DRAM testing and circuits that basically uh, deal with this problem. But there is no work that shows that these errors can be induced by software, for example, the way we do it, and also characterize real DRAM chips. So this is real. It's not circuit simulation, let's say. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's, let's do a look at the URD. This is another reject. I'm, I'm picking the rejects over here <laughs> since we don't have a lot of uh, accepts in this particular case, at least. Okay, basically the mechanism investigated by the authors is one of many well-known disturbed mechanisms. The paper does not discuss the root causes. People are still writing papers about root causes of Rohammer, by the way. <laughs> Uh, this, this paper spurred a lot of circuit level and device level work to understand, oh, why is this happening? Don't, you don't have to have answers. And clearly we did not have a lot of answers. We have conjectures as to why this could be happening, but that's not the goal of the paper, right? Uh, okay, okay, blah, blah. So insignificant novelty, fine. And this is also another expert. Okay, okay. The, that's the bad news, let's say. The paper got rejected. Uh, the students cried a little bit. <laughs> That's what happens also. But uh, I mean, we tried to improve the paper and the next paper got accepted. Uh, this was the ISCA, as you can see, was submitted November, 2013. And you can see some people really liked it. I think this was a different scale. Eight is, I think, award quality. Seven is quite good, as you can see. Two and three, there's still people who don't like it, as you can see. But they were outvoted in this case and we were lucky. If, if they were not outvoted, if they actually could convince others, then we would go into a loop of rejection, the resubmission, let's say. Okay, let's take a look at still these two and three. I mean, some people really liked it, and I'm, not, I'm gonna ignore their comments here. They were, I think, reasonable. Uh, okay, this is very interesting. What you demonstrated in this paper is so-called DRM row hammering issue. You can even find a YouTube video showing that. <laughs> I know this YouTube video. It was actually presented by a DRM testing manufacturer, and we also have it in the rebuttal. Uh, I think Teledyne Lacroix, uh, they, they actually build these test machines in DRAM and was presented in the Memcon conference in October, 2013, one month before the paper was submitted. Uh, of course, months after our first paper was rejected. And this paper basically, uh, this, uh, this video, if you can watch it also if you want, basically they, they're marketing their equipment. They say, oh, DDR3 has some errors called row hammer and we can detect it. With our testing equipment. That's it, basically. So, this reviewer is equating a whole scientific analysis of Rohammer plus solutions, et cetera, with a YouTube video that talks about this in 20 seconds or maybe, okay, maybe one minute, let's say. Right. So, I guess if you want to reject the paper, you can do anything you want, right? If you don't have accountability. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And that was a reject, but they didn't get their day, let's say. <laughs> the other one, I think, this is also interesting. It's a well-known problem to the DRAM community, so no novelty there. In DRAM community, people use something, I don't know. Yeah. So basically, I think, uh, yeah, they wanted to reject the paper because it's a well-known problem, ignoring all of the other merits. I don't know. I still ask people whether you know about Rohammer, and they say, I don't know. <laughs> they read the paper, and they, <laughs> they tell me, oh, I learned about something really new. <laughs> I mean, DRAM designers, even DRAM designers actually didn't know about this issue. There, there was certainly some small class of people knew about the issue because we did communicate with them also. And in, two, in 2011, when we first started the issue, actually not many people were really knew about it. So I guess if you know, if you wait enough time, many people will know. If you reject the paper enough times, many people would know and you can reject the paper again 
saying everybody knows about it. <laughs> I think this is the kind of approach that this reviewer is taking. I don't know. Again, I don't know the reasons why they actually really reject the paper, but maybe there's something uh, more malicious than what they write over here. Okay, because it's, uh, okay, another thing is I think in research, well-known doesn't mean that it's well-studied, right? You may know uh, there's an error mechanism and everybody says, oh, there's old hammer, but there's no scientific study on it, right? So DRM errors are also well-known. There are retention errors. But then why write papers about studying them, right? Oh, this is well-known. Let's move on. Let's only figure out what's not known. Let's not study anything, right? So that's why I think this is a bit, uh, very malicious sort of review. Yes. Doesn't it reflect badly on these conferences if they um, ask reviewers who, who seem to have little idea or somehow be malicious in their review? Yeah, yeah, but they're experts. They cannot have little idea. <laughs> According to them, they're self-proclaimed self experts. But yeah, malicious could be, yeah. Well, uh, I think yes and no, but uh, we don't have a great, uh, much better mechanism other than putting things on archive today. And I, I'm a big believer on open, open releases, actually, with archive. Uh, I think with archive and open reviews, maybe the reviewers also should sign their reviews. Maybe they should say, I, this is me, my name, Onur Mutlu. I'm a professor at ETH. I sign my review. Then maybe they cannot say things like this, right? <laughs> There's a danger over there. I'm not advocating that always is better. There are cases where anonymous review is also good, but anonymous review also uh, lead to accountability issues like this, right? Yeah, they, these people have absolutely zero accountability. Yes. Does it sometimes occur that um, in the aftermath, some of the reviews come and say, oh, I was wrong, or do you know anyone? No, no, that, doesn't, that usually doesn't happen because, I mean, they're anonymous. You don't know them. I mean, they know you after your paper is published, of course. I mean, they may guess who you are if they're really experts in the field, right? Uh, but yeah, uh, it, that usually doesn't happen. But if uh, I think with an open review system, that kind of retraction may happen, right? They may say, oh, I wrote this review. I was wrong, right? That's better feedback probably. <laughs> yes. So are like just really mean and unaccountable like um, reviews common? Because I just it just came to me, I guess, that this is an anonymous system. And you see whenever there's like people like on internet forums with, with identities decoupled from the people, they can say arbitrarily bad things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's very similar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to solve that problem with, with the fully anonymous system. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, there's a YouTube video. I think I, I showed that. Uh, there's also the relevance of this paper to this guy. I mean, this relevance issue keeps coming up, right? I think certainly architecture was the right place to do it because the solutions that we propose are architectural. Like Terra is an architectural, microarchitectural solution, right? Probabilistic adjacent row activation. So this is another way of rejecting papers. If you want to reject the paper, say, oh, it doesn't fit this conference, go to some other conference. <laughs> this is also a common tactic used by reviewers who want to reject papers, as you can see, right? And then, and then they say, I'm not even sure this paper can be published to these venues since it's a well-known problem. <laughs> it's a bit amazing, I think. Yeah. Okay, so this is our rebuttal. I don't know if I want to read all of this, but let me see. Uh, as we acknowledge in the paper, it's true that different types of DRM coupling phenomena have been known to the DRM circuits testing community. And we actually acknowledge this in the paper. This is our rebuttal. You get a chance to rebut, as you can see. It's not clear if people read it. <laughs> That's another thing. However, there's a clear distinction between circuits testing techniques confined to the foundry versus characterization solution of a problem out in the field. The three citations from 10 plus years ago do not demonstrate that disturbance errors exist in DIMMs sold then or now. They do not provide any real data, only simulated ones, let alone a large scale characterization across many DIMMs from multiple manufacturers. They do not construct an attack on real systems and they do not provide any solutions. Finally, our paper already references all three citations provided by the reviewer or their more relevant equivalents. So they're actually more relevant papers we say. The second, third citations provided by the reviewer are on bit line coupling, whereas, whereas we cite works from the same authors on word line coupling, which is more relevant to uh, Rothammer. So you can see that the reviewer actually <laughs> doesn't quite know what they're talking about. And then we were aware of the video from Teledyne, a test equipment company, and have already referenced slides from the same company. So we actually referenced the slides. Uh, in terms of their content regarding row hammer, the video and the slides are identical. All they mention is that aggressive row activations can corrupt adjacent rows. They then advertise how their test equipment is able to capture a timestamp DRM access trace, which can then be post-processed to identify when the number of activations exceeds the user set threshold. 
both the video and the slides do not say that this is a real problem affecting DIMMs on the market now. They do not provide any quantitative data, nor real system demonstration, nor solution. I think this is a good rebuttal, by the way. <laughs> it's not uh, uh, formatted nicely because uh, of the website that I copied it from. But, <laughs> but yeah, this is, I think this rebuttal, I don't know if it worked for this reviewer, but certainly it worked for the committee. Or maybe they didn't read it, they didn't care. They just voted on it and it, the paper got in right. So, I mean, you can see similar uh, comments from a weak reject reviewer also, even though this guy is not, this person is not a strong reject, they uh, give similar comments and say, they basically say Intel is a patent application on a memory controller technique that addresses this exact problem with prior date, June, 2012. And this is what we knew actually, but I think uh, you will see our rebuttal. Yeah, blah, blah, you can, you can read it. Okay, after our paper was submitted, two patents that had been filed by Intel were made public. One is mentioned by the reviewer. Together, the two patents describe what we pose as the sixth potential solution in our paper. Essentially, the memory control maintains a table of counters to track the number of activations through recently activated rows. And if one of the counters exceeds a certain threshold, the memory control notifies the DRAM chips using a special command. The DRAM chips would then refresh an entire region of the rows, of rows that includes both the aggressor and the victims. For the patent to work, DRAM manufacturers must cooperate and implement the special command. It's a convenient way of circumventing the opacity and the logical physical mapping. If implemented, the same command can also be used for our seventh solution, which is para. The implementation of the sixth solution is the storage overhead of the counters and the extra power required to associatively search through them on every activation. Section eight, we already discussed that. That is why we believe our seventh solution to be more attractive. We, we will cite the patents and include a more concrete comparison between two solutions. So these patents are patents that we were aware that Intel filed, but they were not public, so you cannot cite them at the time we submit the paper. Of course, the readers don't care, right? They just search something and say, oh, I found the patent, this is known. Reject. Yes, please. One of you. <laughs> Did Intel, like, if I remember right, you said that you worked um, on this with Intel at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I spent a summer over there, and uh, three of my students spent the same summer. <laughs> were these patents the result of that cooperation, or were they already filed previously to the paper being? Written? Well, they, they were filed while we were together working on the problem. Yes. So it was a result of the cooperation, basically. Yes. <laughs> But we were not authors because we don't want to be authors on that patent in the, in the Intel. In general, I prefer not to be authors on a patent. <laughs> yes. So I'm not 100% sure I understand the process sure. with the review. So the, um, like the reviews from the reviewer are only visible to the authors or are they also visible to the other reviewers? So the reviews uh, are visible to the authors as well as other reviewers, yes. And do the reviewers get a chance to change their, their uh, grades after the review? After the rebuttal, yes, but they didn't in this case. <laughs> and, and whether the paper is accepted is only based on the average or the majority of these no, grades? No, there's, or... a, there's a discussion that happens, basically. Even though, even though the scores may be really good, uh, the paper may still get rejected because the dominant reviewers may, don't, may not like it right during the discussion. So the reviewers get together and then make a decision. Yeah, yeah. It's a part of a larger committee meeting. In fact, even, even people who may not have read the paper may be part of that decision because based on the discussion that happens, they may inject some comments and they may influence the process, basically. It's a complicated process. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, nevertheless, we were able to induce a large number of DRM disturbances on all the latest Intel AMD transforms we tested, blah, blah. Importantly, the patterns do not provide quantitative characterization. So it's, it's very difficult to dismiss things with a patent, I think. And these are the Intel patents that we cite in the paper, actually. Okay, so these are my suggestions to the reviewers. I don't have any, any other choice. I think an open system is better, but in general, I think people need to be fair. And I think there's a huge fairness problem because of the lack of accountability, perhaps. I think people need to be fair-minded to begin with, but I don't know. Even if you're the expert, you do not know it all, right? I mean, I'm an expert in some things, but I approach things in a way, okay, maybe I don't know it, right? Maybe this, maybe my, my expertise is also bounded, right, in the end, but people don't see it that way, maybe. Be open-minded, again, even if you're the expert, you do not know it all. Be accepting of different diverse research methods. This is not a test, this is a testing paper. I'm an architect, I don't care about this. That's a terrible thinking, right? There's no single way of doing research also. There are many, many methods. And I think you can see the destructive comments. What I mean by this is probably clear, right? These are not constructive comments. How can you argue? It's not a technical comment about the paper, right? Subjective comments. I'll oh, leave it to the DRM manufacturers. That's not the content of the paper, right? And I think people also have double standards, which is interesting. 
Meaning, I think there, there, there's some malice also going on internally because they may not want this paper published for some whatever reason, right? And I can see the DRM manufacturer's perspective, right? If you're a DRM expert, you want to protect your company. Maybe you're one of those reviewers who give it a strong reject. Right? Possible. Okay, but I think all of this actually blocks or delays scientific progress. And these are really bad reasons to block and delay scientific progress. In this case, I think we were delayed a little bit but maybe not too much, let's say. But I mean, if we were unlucky, we could have been delayed a lot more, right? And you can imagine at that point what happens, right? All bets are off. It's, yes. I've heard re reviewers say that they do this kind of things because they, it's hard to differentiate between genius and crazy, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, say, <laughs> I don't know, Are reviewers say this? Yeah, I've heard many people say this. Like, I have to discriminate the idea that crazy have so many of them and only a small fraction of them are actually good. Uh -huh. So I, I don't have the time to explore in depth every one of them, but I can find this really small portion of good ideas. Okay. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, but that's, uh, you can also see the good in many ideas potentially, right? Yeah, that's one approach, basically kill everything so that only a small fraction survive. <laughs> but the other approach is maybe see the good in many things and let more things survive, let's say. Yeah. Okay, and in this case, as I said, I think you will read the paper, so you will be the judge of the paper. And I don't think the paper changed much <laughs> between the two iterations. <laughs> okay, and this is actually a fun reading. I would recommend this to, to you. Uh, this was uh, an article in Wall Street Journal saying, could Einstein get published today? Because Einstein actually wrote papers that where he injected a lot of his personality, let's say, and his views. And I think these reviews would kill him. <laughs> basically saying even worse things maybe or maybe they like them i don't know i have no idea actually but basically it's very difficult i think to uh, uh somehow uh we're delaying progress in the review process because of these non-reasons today we need to be more open-minded uh in fact i think einstein one of his papers i don't remember which one uh he sent it uh he moved from uh he moved to america and he sent the uh paper to a journal and the journal uh i don't remember which journal you can find this information online uh, my, my memory doesn't serve me well i have a lot of data retention errors right now uh, but basically he sent the paper to a journal and the journal basically came back and said we sent your paper to reviewers and here are their comments einstein was really annoyed at this saying i didn't tell you to send my paper to reviewers I told you to publish my paper <laughs> that's why i sent you my paper <laughs> so he was really annoyed he took the paper Address the comments and publish in some other journal. <laughs> Maybe a less prestigious journal, but still. Yeah. So I, even he had issues with their viewers, basically. <laughs> okay. So I think uh, we didn't cover these slides, right? Have you ever seen this? Okay. Uh, so this is something that I would recommend. Actually, this is a rec book I recommend if you're interested in computer systems performance analysis. It's one of the uh, very, uh, let's say, rigorous books on the topic. It's a bit old, but fundamentals don't necessarily change. But I'm not going to talk about performance analysis. I'm going to talk about this decision makers games. Basically, this book has some interesting nuggets also in it, basically saying, even if you do everything correctly in performance analysis, in, part, in this particular case, uh, it may not be enough to persuade your audience, the decision makers, to follow your recommendations, meaning accept your paper, let's say. <laughs> The list shown in box 10.2 is a, comp a compilation of reasons for rejection heard at various performance analysis presentations. You can use the list by presenting it immediately and pointing out that the reason for rejection is not new and that the analysis deserves more con consideration. Maybe paper should be accepted so that other people can evaluate it, right? As opposed to some reviewers killing it for subjective reasons. And we will see those reasons soon. Also, the list is helpful in getting the competing proposals rejected. He's making a joke, of course, over here. <laughs> so basically, there is no clear end of an analysis. Uh, an analysis can be rejected simply on the grounds that the problem needs more analysis. Uh, this is the first reason listed in box 10.2, which is this box. This needs more analysis, as you can see. <laughs> and then the second most common reason for rejection of an analysis uh, and for endless debate is the workload. Like the first reviewer who rejected the saying, this is not real, right? <laughs> uh, since workloads are always based on the past measurements, they're applicable to current or future environments can always be questioned. Actually, workload is one of the first, first, one of the four areas of the discussion that lead the performance presentation into an endless debate. These rat holes 
and their relative size in terms of time consumed are shown in figure you can see over here. Presenting this cartoon at the beginning of a presentation helps to avoid these areas. <laughs> I would recommend this actually. I, I like this a lot. And this is true actually. Uh, I mean, workload is really endless debate, right? So is it my workload? Is it your workload? Who cares about this workload? There's no end to this, basically. Yes. Uh, what exactly is meant with workload? Like workload for oh. the reviewer or for the researcher? <laughs> or No, no. In this particular case, uh, you have a computer system, you analyze its performance, for example, and you're running some application. Are you running a graph processing application, a database application, a machine learning application? If you analyze only machine learning, somebody can say, oh, why don't you analyze databases? If you analyze both of them, somebody can say, oh, why didn't you analyze graph analysis? If you analyze all of them, somebody can say, oh, why didn't you analyze genome analysis? Right? There's no end to this, basically. <laughs> That's the kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, Similar to the comment that we received, right? This is not real. It doesn't happen in a real DRM usage scenario. But there are other workloads where this happens, right? And this, this person completely dismisses them. Show me the real DRM usage scenario and then come to me. Meaning real workload, right? Okay, and then the next one is metrics, configuration, and detail. And these are actually true. Somebody can always question your metrics. You evaluate performance, but what about energy? Right. You can keep going on and on. And experiments, you can actually... Basically, I think uh, there's... Uh, you can always reject something. There's an endless number of reasons to reject something. Right. I think you need to really see the conceptual and uh, new benefit that something brings to the table. Because if you're in a rejection mindset, and if you, I guess, go into the field saying that I'm going to reject, I'm going to reject 99% of the ideas. I'm going to find only 1%. It's very easy to reject things, I think. And this uh, uh, book shows methods of doing that if you're interested. I like this last reason over here. I mean, you can see the different reasons over here. Some of these are actually kind of dated, but nobody has ever done that before. Number 13. You have a new idea. And that's a reason for rejecting, actually, sometimes. <laughs> it may violate some future standard. <laughs> you can see these are all speculative. And he's making, I think, I mean, this is real, but he's also kind of uh, telling people what not to do, let's say. Uh, OK, it's going to increase the complexity and cost. Let us, let us keep it simple and simple, stupid. And your idea is not stupid. I don't know. You can try to understand what that is. It's not simple. But I like this. This impacts hardware. If, if people are software minded, let's say that's beyond today's technology. And look at this last one. Why change? It's working OK. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually a real mindset issue. And I mean, this, I think you can see it in their views also, right? Why look at this? The AI manufacturers will solve it. Right. I think it's the same thing, basically. Yeah, manufacturers have solved it before. They're going to solve it again. I don't want to hear about it. Don't work on it. That's the same mentality. Why change? It's working OK. Because it's worked OK before. And I think this is really a killer mentality for any kind of progress. OK, <laughs> this is kind of fun, right? OK, these are some reviews that after the paper was published. So there's this uh, somehow messy and uh, ugly, let's say, political competition of papers uh, one year later, you submit your paper to this top picks, let's say, conference, which used to be okay. And uh, now it's actually very bad, in my opinion. Uh, and they basically evaluate the papers for these the long term impact and novelty. Of course, after a paper was published one year later, or less than one year uh, after it was published, how are you going to evaluate that? But let's look at this. I mean, these are all very speculative, also. So we received these reviews. I poked around a bit, and DRM vendors have already solved this problem. <laughs> That's what uh, they're talking about, the row hammer. DRM row hammering appears to be a known problem. Same thing, basically. So it's, it's actually interesting that researchers are uh, also in the mindset that, okay, somebody tells you they solved the problem, you trust them, right? Is that the right thing to do? I will heavily doubt that. <laughs> I think we proved that. That's, uh, you should really doubt that, right? Okay, another one. Another one is actually that you can see how, how, uh, how poor uh, these views are, right? I seem to remember that during the presenting, ESCA, it was pointed out that the air manufacturers have already fixed the problem. So where's the novelty and long-term impact? That's an interesting tone to use in a scientific review process, let's say. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's why I give these, uh, let's say, list of suggestions to the reviewers whenever I speak to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, crowd that would benefit from this, let's say. <laughs> okay, so I think overall we need to fix this accountability problem. There is an accountability problem, and I think some of you uh, maybe are interested in fixing this. Hopefully, you will do better than any of these people. 
just like main memory needs intelligent controllers, research community needs accountable reviewers. <laughs> There's no way beyond that, I think. And I think I talked about this a lot more actually in some of these talks and you can find them. Okay, so as researchers, what can you do, right? Because you're, you're, you're actually uh, subject to this malicious attack, let's say, from the reviewers, <laughs> potentially malicious or potentially erroneous, right? But erroneous can be malicious as we discussed in Byzantine uh, general's problem, right? It could be, yeah, they don't know or they're malicious. I don't care. In the end, they are wrong. They, 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 they basically are not uh, providing the right feedback, basically. I think in the end, I don't think there's any other way but following your passion, right? If you believe in the work, you cannot drop it, right? You, can, you cannot get derailed by this sort of thing. Because this sort of thing happens, okay, I'm, we're talking about the research, but this sort of thing also happens in business as well, right? Somebody may try to kill your idea for, let's say, non-reasons. In fact, those reasons from that page, you can actually pull, pull, it, up, pull it up also. So you need to be resilient, I think. Uh, I'm going to give you more examples where papers are rejected more than five times, potentially later. I think uh, focus on learning and scholarship are critical. And I think in the end, quality of your work defines your impact. But you do need to sometimes uh, well, publish it, basically, right? Otherwise, impact will be limited, right? And I think in the end, you will need to work hard to enable that passion. And I guess with a good mindset, goals, and focus, you can make a good impact on the world. I don't have any other suggestions. And fix the accountability problem, let's say. <laughs> Okay, I mean, there's more in this interview. We talk about some of these issues with these person. I don't talk about these issues over here, but I think this resilience is really important. And I think Richard Hamming also talks about this, right? You get, I don't know, you're not in an ideal situation. You make the best out of it or you turn it into a positive setting. Not, all, not always easy. No question about that, right? I mean, uh, especially I think it's hard on PhD students who maybe uh, are not, yet educated enough to take this in a certain way, right? Because they get this, uh, they think this review process is perfect and they get this review from somebody they don't know. They think they're experts because they mark themselves as experts, right? For, I'm an expert. <laughs> and they get this review, right? And what do you do, right? It's easy to give up, of course, right? Basically don't give up though. Basically figure out how to make it work. Uh, it's hard to change the entire system and the system is, more broken, there are ways we are trying to change the system. I think archive is a very good one, for example. We put papers on archive uh, when we think they're ready. But again, it's not a perfect system also because somehow these conferences are still, let's say, prestigious, right? Uh, because they do what you suggested, <laughs> what, what the reviewer suggested, right? Not what you suggested, but what the reviewer suggested. They basically try to eliminate as much as possible without regard to whether they're the right things to eliminate. <laughs> yes. What exactly is archive? Oh, archive. Oh, you don't know. Okay. Archive.org. Uh, this is an uh, open repository of papers. Basically, you have a manuscript, research manuscript. You write it and you put it up online. It's, uh, if you go to archive.org, you'll find it. Maybe I'll show you. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually started from physics. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very broad, basically. Uh, initially, it started from physics. Uh, okay, that brings me to the end of the lecture. That's good, but let me let me try to find this and show you. Yeah, yeah, uh, there, it's called BioArchive. There's one for medicine, MedArchive, but it all started with archive. Well, you can see it here, but I don't think people on Zoom are seeing privacy settings. Should I agree to all and reject all? Okay, I guess reject all, and what will happen? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll kick me out of the website. <laughs> okay, yeah, you can see. Where is this? Yeah, this is the archive repository, for example. And you can see astrophysics, physics, mathematics, computer science. You can find uh, hardware architecture. This is what, in general, computer architecture, but uh, certainly this is where you can find. There's also, uh, I think, uh, security. It's called, where is that? Cryptography and security. Yeah. You can see many papers. It's an open system, basically. You don't need reviews to publish there. <laughs> but of course, it's not a, a prestigious conference also. Yes? Do you ever read the new publications in archive? Or... I sometimes do, yeah, yeah. If I, if I find research, so I, I'm subscribed. Uh, I actually moderate the hardware architecture section of archive, but uh, I, I'm also subscribed to uh, their uh, lists. And when they think there are some relevant papers, they send it. 
But of course, yeah, there are a lot of papers, so it's very hard to read. So uh, of course, some of them are probably not good papers also, right? Because there's absolutely no selection process over here other than the fact that, okay, it looks like research. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, have you ever been a, what do you call it, a reviewer for a conference somewhere? Oh yeah, many. <laughs> yeah, I do this quite regularly. <laughs> And uh, do, are you uh, an open reviewer? Like, do you sign your reviews or? No, I think at this point, nobody does that. But I, I would argue that I try to exercise what I preach. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that also happens probably, yes. <laughs> you can always, that, that's, I think, uh, I think that's the danger basically. Meaning uh, if you're anonymous, you have no accountability, right? Yeah, I think that needs to be fixed somehow. But but some conferences have moved to a process where their users are also open. Uh, so I think uh, one of our papers that was recently published at Genome Biology, for example, uh, you can find their use online also and our responses to their use also. But I think you can do that only after it's published. Uh, it's also not good, right? <laughs> but if you're completely open, maybe you submit your paper to archive and your users review it online. And maybe they are not, they're not anonymous. I think some machine learning conferences do that, although I haven't looked at that yet. Yes. Well, I see um, like why you want to get paper published and, and why you want to have an impact. I mean, you seem to be so focused on rejects and on those conferences. And if I follow your advice, why don't you just like, I mean, except of course for some reviews that require some, some more work on the paper, but why don't you just move on? and like work on something else instead of trying to get your paper published oh. for three years? Well, in this case, it was not three years, but in some cases it could be three years, yes. Well, I think in the end, it's the impact, right? Uh, what do you do, right? Do you drop the research? Do you put it on archive and move on? Uh, yes, you could do that. You can put it on archive and move on. But if, you, if the idea is really poised to have lots of impact, uh, you also want to publish in a venue that's very visible, right? I think the downside and maybe also the upside at the same time of these very visible venues is you can have high impact because many people read the papers over there. That's the reason basically to reach more people. Yeah. That's why I think giving up is not a good idea. I think starting, uh, not working on not un, uh, Unimportant problems is a good start, for example. Maybe you can give up an unimportant problem, but you shouldn't start working on an unimportant problem to begin with, I would argue. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, some more. Um, yeah, it's a general question about uh, research papers because I noted yesterday and also today that sometimes you give your affiliation as only ETH and sometimes as ETH and CMU. And I was wondering uh -huh. if there's any particular reason for this. Oh, I think it, it really depends. I mean, I'm affiliated with both ETH and CMU right now. Uh, my main affiliation is ETH, of course, since I'm not physically at CMU. Uh, but uh, usually, uh, if, if there's a student of mine who's at CMU, I also include my CMU affiliation. So if, there, if there's a student of mine who was involved in the paper and they are affiliated with CMU, I also include my CMU affiliation. If there's no such thing, then I only give the ETH one. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you can't maybe expect people to give like their names or something on reviews because uh -huh. that could lead to some other undesirable consequences. Uh -huh. Couldn't you at least uh, expect them to disclose their sort of affiliations? Not necessarily where they work, but for example, if they're a professor, if uh -huh. they work at IBM or some sort of detail on that so it also gets nice <laughs> at least it'll give some idea of their background or potential uh -huh. conflicts of interest yeah yeah i mean these uh yeah yeah maybe that's a little bit more transparency of course than what we have today sure yeah but i think people would some people would still be uncomfortable with that because they like business as usual right they like rejecting papers maybe <laughs> <laughs> because they want to have that uh, opportunity yes you think it could also be that the reviewer was running out of time to review stuff oh, yeah. and so, then just um, 
a yeah. rate, uh, give a review that he they would think will be mainstream, and then just um, <laughs> get on with stuff. <laughs> but usually, if uh, I mean, I've seen that sort of thing many, many times. Of course, usually, uh, if you're going to do that, then say that and say uh, discount my opinion, right? Usually, if their are is running out of time, they should not say, okay, strong reject because of this reason, right? Yeah, I've seen reviewers who have not even read the papers, basically. Yeah, many, many reviews. I can expose many, many more reviews. I have a database of these. <laughs> I'd say <laughs> probably thousands of reviews. <laughs> anyway, I think, I think I've given you some examples, right? Especially on, on a topic like this. Okay. Shall we take a break? Okay, let's take, a, I guess, 16 minutes. <laughs> 16 minute break and be back at 56, 50, 56, 57, 56 past. And then we'll start computation in memory. No.
and the video is not here. Are we still live streaming? I hope so. Ah, that's not what I want. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we were talking in the break with some of your fellow students and uh, I think, uh, like we were talking about Einstein's paper, right? That uh, he injected some speculative things in his papers. And these are some speculative uh, things that are not proven. He doesn't have experiments uh, and he doesn't have the theoretical uh, backing also, but he mentioned this as something based on his insights at that point. And this sort of thing may be rejected easily today actually, but I would argue that these are also very important for science and progress, right? Because if you expose that thing, maybe someone can get inspired to actually take it to the next level. You either prove it or disprove it, right? So a paper should not be only about some things that you can have absolutely proved. And that's it. And you cannot inject any like future theory. Basically what Einstein was doing, theorizing. He had a particular style and he was really theorizing his paper saying, okay, I think this is true. That's it, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> and people may not be actually amenable to that sort of thing. But I think that's really extremely important for progress. So I think with the mindset of current reviewers, I mean, they don't even believe what's written uh, as experimentally demonstrated. So they, they also want to reject this sort of things. But I think this is very dangerous for progress in the end. So uh, reviews that reject this sort of thing because of style are dangerous for progress. And also reviews that reject real things based on speculative reasons are also dangerous for progress. So I think we, we need to give uh, more uh, benefit of the doubt to the authors as opposed to taking the reviewers as, let's say, oh, this is our golden standard. Whatever the reviewer says is true. I think it's better to take the perspective that, okay, authors should have the benefit of the doubt. If they're not doing something absolutely wrong, in their experiments, for example, or in their methodology, they should really have the benefit of the doubt. They should be published, right? And that enables more science. And again, the responsibility in the end is completely on the authors, right? Okay, I write this Rohammer paper. I think it's correct. It gets published. At that point, responsibility is completely on me, right? If I'm wrong and I'm disproven 10 years down the road, or I don't know, next year, nobody cares about the viewers, right? The responsibility is completely on the author. <laughs> it's my credibility at stake, right, as an author. So who, who is the reviewer? Who cares about the reviewers from the scientific progress perspective, right? If the reviewer kills the paper, then nobody gets inspired about something that's killed and not published. So I think we have our priorities a bit wrong in the way we're doing reviews today. We're basically putting too much credibility to unaccountable reviewers while really taking away the benefit of the doubt from completely accountable authors. Because once you have your name on a paper, you're completely accountable for that, right? If you did a stupid thing, five years down the road, maybe someone will say, oh, this is completely wrong, and here's why. So I think that's, uh, that's, that's the problem with the current system. The CU system is unfortunately too much uh, biased towards trusting their viewers, as opposed to give the benefit of the doubt to the author. Okay, don't trust them necessarily, but give the benefit of the doubt. Does that make sense? And that's the argument, I think. And that's, I think, a very, in my, in my opinion, that's a very compelling argument. In the end, nobody cares about who reviewed what paper, but everybody cares about if you wrote a good paper or a bad paper, who are you? <laughs> okay, and that's real accountability. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I guess let's move on. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk about processing in memory. But I think what we have discussed so far is kind of building up to it, right? This is, if we were actually uh, doing a full lecture on processing in memory, this is what we would do. We talked about major trends affecting main memory. We talked about the needs for intelligent memory controllers from circuits and devices, I think I, hope, I hopefully convinced you that you need to do something different in your memory controllers and make them more intelligent to solve some of these scaling issues. We actually did talk about pull from systems and applications. I'm gonna remind you, jog your memory. And then we're gonna talk about processing in memory and talk about two different directions of it, two fundamentally different directions, processing using memory 
and processing near memory and talk about adoption issues and conclude. I think this will be maybe today's lecture plus next week, maybe even overflow to the week after that, because this is such an important topic and there are a lot of aspects of it we will discuss. So I think you've seen this before. If you haven't, stop me, but we talked about the key system trends, right? Data access image bottleneck, energy consumption is key limiter, and data moment energy dominates computes. And basically high latency and high energy is caused by data moments because we have these long energy hungry interconnects, energy hungry electrical interfaces, and we move large amounts of data over them, right? And we're basically wasting energy and power uh, as well as performance. So the opportunity is to minimize the data moment by performing computation directly or near where the data resides. That's generally known as processing in memory, in memory computation, in memory processing, near data processing, there are many variants of this name, let's say, near data computation, computation in memory, computing in memory. I could keep, basically look at all the variants. But, but I will refer to, uh, process, to it as processing in memory in general, and then distinguish two approaches to it. And the general concept is really applicable to any data storage and movement unit, basically. It could be, you could be processing inside the SSD, main memory, network, controllers, in SRAM caches, right? Basically today, what we have is computation units and storage units are completely decoupled, right? Certainly processor chip or accelerator chip, GPU chip, FPGA chip, your favorite processing chip is decoupled from main memory. And inside the chip also, if you look at the chip, memory is decoupled from computation, right? You have caches in a general purpose processor, and then there are compute units. And you have to move the data from the caches to the compute units so that you can process it. Now, FPGAs are a different beast uh, where you actually have blocks of things and uh, compute and memory units are more tighter coupled compared to CPUs and GPUs. So FPGAs from that perspective is a little bit better inside the chip, of course, but outside the chip, it's completely decoupled from memory, right? Okay, but the general concept is really applicable to bringing uh, computation to where the data resides. Okay, and this, I think, this has, I think, benefits in terms of all of these issues over here. Uh, but we are going to look at it, especially from this perspective. I think energy efficiency is key. But again, I think uh, designing processing in memory systems can help security potentially by moving the data less in the system, meaning by exposing data less. This is a, not a very well-studied area as much. But people, for example, try to attack uh, the system bus and try to eavesdrop on it and try to figure out what's going on. If, there, if the data doesn't move much, then probably the fundamental vulnerability of data also reduces, right? If it stays in a single chip, for example. Uh, I, I believe in that, but of course there needs to be more work uh, to be done in that area. Low latency also, I think uh, if, you, if you keep the data in a single chip, you're fundamentally lower latency to begin with. And I think specialized architectures can be enabled via using processing in memory too. So in a sense, processing in memory can enable uh, a lot of different things in these directions. Okay, I'll go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I motivated earlier uh, that uh, you have to have your basic needs satisfied before you can move on to the further needs over here. And I said that reliability and security are the most important things. If you don't have a reliable and computing uh, secure system, you cannot think about doing something better. But maybe someone can also argue that energy is better, right? If I cannot even turn on my phone, I don't care how reliable it is, right? Because I cannot turn on my phone, I don't have any battery. In it. And this happens to me once in a while, unfortunately, with my phones. Okay, so... Uh, basically, we want a sustainable world, high performance, energy efficient, and sustainable. Okay, basically, I think we discussed this. Uh, participants, can I see your application? I don't know what that means. Does that mean they were not seeing it before? Okay, anyway, as long as you can see it online, that's fine. And I think I see it online over here. Uh, basically, uh, our current design principles really cause energy waste because we're moving data around and also a great performance loss because Again, we're moving data around, right? We try to overcome this performance loss by making our systems more and more complicated, uh, by adding caches, prefetching, multi-threading, out of order execution, et cetera. But I think we need to solve the problem at its heart, let's say. We need to uh, not move the data. I think you've seen these slides, so I'm gonna skip many of these. But today we're overwhelmingly processor-centric and everything has to go through the processor, let's say. So maybe we should not, we should enable some computation capability in the other units also. I think we've discussed these, right? So, okay, I'm gonna skip these. 
there's enough evidence, let's say, that says uh, even though we put a lot of effort to overcome the performance loss due to moving data, still the processors are not good enough to overcome the performance loss. Basically, most of the time they're waiting. And I think we've seen uh, these also. And this is Google's recent results, well, recent, relatively recent, that show that again, processors most of the time waiting and not doing useful work. Okay. I think we also discussed this basically. We have a grossly imbalanced system and overly complex and bloated processor because we're moving data to the processor to process it, right? Okay, as a result, I think uh, because memory is such a bottleneck, most of the systems we design today are dedicated to storing and moving data, yet still the system is bottlenecked by memory. Right? And you've seen this picture also, so I'm gonna skip this quickly again. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I think, uh, again, this picture may be old uh, from 2015, but even the newer results show something similar. I think I've seen some, something recently, for example, showing that a memory access consumes 640 times the energy of uh, a simple addition, let's say. So people have different numbers depending on different technology and depending on how they implement this. Uh, and essentially logic scaled really well, but memory and interconnect did not scale really well. I've, I've actually seen something recent from Intel also showing that, let's say in the 1990s, uh, logic was this big, and memory and interconnect were smaller in terms of bottleneck. And Intel in 2020, basically they show logic is this big. In fact, the person who was presenting this, I think he's an Intel fellow, Ian Young in circuits. Uh, and he basically says that computation is not a problem. That's what I've been saying for years, basically. <laughs> he said that computation is free, let's say. If he, I think, okay, this is what he said. He, he said computation is free. I wouldn't argue it's free, but uh, uh, yeah, in the, in the grand scheme of things, it looks free, right? And that's true. Basically, they're getting at this. Memory and interconnect did not scale over decades as a result where we have this picture over here. And again, you can read some papers, but uh, there are many other studies. And I've already motivated this also. Basically, we do not want to move data. Right? And so to be able to minimize the data movement or uh, do the data movement when it really makes sense to do so, let's say, uh, I think we need a paradigm shift. And we need to change our thinking so that we can enable this computation with minimal data. We want to be able to compute where it makes sense, as opposed to having only one choice, which is bring the data into the process. And again, I'm considering a processor in the general sense. It could be an accelerator, it could be a GPU, it could be an FPGA. You're still bringing the data that to that computation unit, right? But we have no other choice. There are so many other places in the system, and we cannot tell that place to do computation on this data. So we should really change that. We should enable that cap capability. And that's the idea of being data centric because as opposed to processor centric, you're thinking, okay, there's this data I want to operate on. Let me operate on where the data is, right? As opposed to being processor centric and pulling it to the processor. Okay, so I think uh, this is a general idea, of course, it could be applied to any part of the system where there is data, but we're gonna look at the specific case of processing in memory, meaning main memory. I think main memory is quite interesting because today we have very large capacities. It comes at a cost as we discussed in the last lectures, but still we're building larger and larger capacity memories and applications have been enabled because of that large capacity and the latencies are not unreasonable, meaning latency of main memory is still quite good compared to an SSD, for example, and forget about hard disk and tape. Uh, nobody wants to access hard disk today, right? Even though you may have a hard disk, you're probably using it as backup. Uh, Okay, today people are building in-memory databases, in-memory graph processing engines, in-memory media processing engines, in-memory machine learning engines. Uh, like as we discussed, the Cerebras wafer scale engine was also trying to be in-memory, right? And computation in a single huge chip. Okay, but basically we want to be able to enable processing capability. And uh, basically we want, uh, memory should be an intelligent agent that can respond to queries. Meaning, I mean, today what happens is you read, write, refresh, and memory responds to those, right? That's a dumb agent. It cannot operate on data. Uh, we should be able to ask questions to memory. Memory, can you op execute this operation for me, for example? And then basically say, okay, if you can execute it, please execute it and return me the results, right? And of course, there are many questions over here, some of which we're gonna cover in the course of the next few lectures. Not all of which we're gonna answer, but I think it's quite exciting. How do you design the memory? We're gonna talk about that. How do you design the controllers? How do you design the processor chip and in-memory units? Processor chip may change also after this. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that. How do you design the software and hardware interfaces to enable this? We're gonna talk about different issues here uh, because today's hardware interfaces do not enable this because you, you cannot send computation to memory, right? 
It's a very rigid interface. Today's software is not designed for this clearly. How do you design the system software compilers and languages to enable this? And then how do you design the algorithms to map to the computation capability on the device or devices or different parts of the system? And also, how do you rethink the theoretical foundations of computing? Uh, how many of you here have taken a theory of computation course? Okay, some people. Uh, how did you evaluate uh, the algorithms? Meaning the complexity, computational complexity of algorithms. Big O notation, big theta notation, right? Okay, in theory, uh, theory of computing, you didn't talk about those? Okay, I see. I guess I, I guess I see it depends on how you actually uh, divide the classes, let's say. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you see it in some class at least. <laughs> maybe algorithms, maybe computing theory. But basically today's algorithms are judged, let's say, evaluated in terms of computational complexity by counting operations, right? Big O notation, big theta notation. And if computation is free, like we discussed. Of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Maybe that doesn't matter as much, right? Maybe we should be evaluating our algorithm with some other complexity metric, right? And I don't think that exists today, actually. So I think this gets to the heart of the problem. Basically, even the theory of computation or algorithmic complexity theory is based so much on processor-centric assumptions. The assumption is processor is the king, let's say, and you have to process this data. And that's why computation is important. But we're in a regime today, computation is not as important. So maybe we really need to rethink how we have the theoretical foundations of algorithms and computational complexity theory so that they can incorporate some data-centric uh, constructs, let's say, right? I don't know how it's done, of course, but I think this should be done going into the future. And that's, that's, the, uh, that's what I mean by data-centric paradigm, right? This really cuts across everything in computing because everything is com in computing is really assuming that you have a processor-centric system. Okay, that's why it's an exciting area. That's also why it cuts across the stack like this. And, uh, but I think we can get there step by step, basically. Did, we, did I assign this paper in the homework? Or, okay, maybe this is what we should assign in homework two, let's say, <laughs> because homework two is not released yet. But I think I will assign this. This is a recent review paper or overview paper that we wrote. Uh, uh, it's a bit long, but I think I hope it's easy to read. That basically gives uh, the uh, overview of today's processing in memory systems, why uh, we need them and what can be done with them, let's say. And you can read it for more detail. I'm going to talk about it actually in these lectures also. Basically, there are two approaches that we're going to talk about, processing using memory and processing near memory. And I think this uh, paper is a good, let's say, textbook kind of thing. Even though it's a bit, uh, it was written December 2020, I think it's still useful to read it. Okay, so let's jump in. I also call this processing data where it makes sense, right? Today, I think, uh, if you think about it in a very fundamental way, uh, let's say maybe Einstein would say, write this and then get rejected, right? <laughs> I want to process data where it makes sense. Of course, what does it mean where it makes sense, right? Basically, if you want to minimize the data movement, you should really process data locally where it is, right? And this is not a new idea. This is an old idea, actually. Uh, in fact, this is one of the oldest papers, these two, that basically propose uh, doing logic inside memory. And you can see the titles, even you don't need to read the paper, but uh, similar logic and memory computer. And this, this, part, this paper in particular, Harold Stone, uh, who, who was a computer architect at IBM, wrote this early paper while he was at Stanford, actually. He basically said, uh, going forward, uh, we should really merge computing and memory because we will have a bottleneck. So he was very forward looking. And if you want to have a scalable system, uh, we need to have many, many pins, but we cannot afford that many pins. So put computing and memory together, basically, so that we can reduce cost. His argument was kind of cost and scalability in the end, not energy. At that time, energy, nobody cared about energy, let's say. This is 1970, right? Uh, but I think it's still a good argument uh, at that time. Of course, that didn't happen, right? So this is an old idea, you can see, 50 years. And then there have been other papers that were published saying, okay, let's do processing in memory. I'm not going to go to the history of it, but you can read this uh, our paper that talks about some of the history of it uh, in some detail. But there have been a lot of work that was done over the decades and decades, but this idea never took off during that time, except in recent years, let's say.
But also, okay, why, why we examine such an idea? Uh, I think there are good reasons. I think uh, for something as disruptive as doing computation in memory to take place, you need to have the conditions right also, right? Maybe the conditions, I would argue that the conditions were not right at that time. Uh, why? Because I think memory scaling was going still quite well at that time. And we didn't have the huge system level scalability problems with energy and performance. And also logic was a bigger bottleneck perhaps at that time, right? If you think about it, this was, uh, after, uh, after this paper was written, there was 50 years of logic scaling and energy and per uh, performance uh, of logic improved, but the memory did not improve. So this became a much bigger bond. Maybe these papers were ahead of their times, let's say. Well ahead of their times. Okay, so why is it interesting today? I think today we're having a lot of difficulties with technology uh, as we have seen in earlier lectures, right? And today people are looking into, finally looking into, let's say, new memory architectures, right? And you see this uh, with 3D stacked architectures, which you will talk about. You have a logic there under memory layers. And this is another example. You see some experimental chips that look into like simple row buffer level operations in memory. And more recently, uh, you see real processing in memory chips or near data processing chips, as we will see. And even big companies like Samsung are actually developing these at this point. So certainly today, uh, people are more open because the scaling is not going well in, in memory technology. Uh, that was not the case for, let's say, 40 years uh, or so after the first paper that I showed you had been published, right? Scaling was quite well. It was business as usual, let's say. But at some point, scaling had a lot of problems and business as usual needs to change. Okay, but the systems and applications are also important, right? Uh, so. For, for any paradigm to change, I think you really need to be squeezed and you have nowhere to escape. Today, I think at the bottom, bottom of the computing stack, technology is pushing us to do something else like intelligent controllers to solve the scaling problems. And the top of the computing stack, the software algorithms, et cetera, are, are telling us basically we have a huge problem in scalability, energy, and performance because of data movement. Right? And we discussed this also. So I think today, uh, we're being squeezed by both ends of the computing stack, technology and let's say it's called software at the higher end, software and systems. Uh, and we want intelligent controls for both. Okay, we discussed this. Uh, so applications, basically I think another way of looking at it is memory scaling issues are real and we have a lot of trouble and application scaling issues are real and we have a lot of trouble also. We're gonna talk about this paper, for example, that talks about a particular way of doing processing in memory for graph processing. Basically, we, we are having a lot of difficulty scaling applications, performance as well as energy efficiency. And it's because of the data bottleneck. And as a result, I think processing in memory is also becoming real, as you can see. And these are commercial companies. I mean, uh, people actually produced some test chips in the past, uh, in 1990s, for example, uh, maybe early 2000s as well. Uh, but again, never, uh, there was really never a commercial uptake of these ideas. Uh, so I think the technology conditions have made it right, let's say, today to look at these ideas. And we're gonna talk about the UpMem engine. Uh, we analyze uh, this quite a bit, and this is the system that we analyze. You can see that this is real, right? That's more than 2,500 DRAM processing units inside each bank. And a processing unit is a simple processing unit, as you can see, but it's programmable. Uh, and uh, it's next to each bank, for every bank basically has this sort of processing units. And we will see upsides and downsides of it. And this is the paper uh, that uh, actually Juan may talk about it. But also, I mean, bigger companies are also putting processing in memory as we discussed briefly. Uh, Samsung is doing very similar, something very similar. These pictures don't necessarily show it. Actually, there's another picture. Uh, yeah, where is the picture? Okay, here. Basically, next to each bank, they have this PCU, programmable control unit, basically. So it's very similar to the upmem approach, let's say. Near, in a, in a DRAM chip next to each bank, put some processing capability. And uh, the UpMem approach puts processing capability that's very general. You can see this is a general purpose pipeline with caches. And as a result, it can execute many applications. I don't have it here, but that's fine. We'll see that. Whereas this Samsung's architecture is more specific. And the, the way uh, you can see the specificity of it, basically, it's, it's basically mainly to designed to do a multiply and accumulate really fast. You can see the instruction set. It's not very general, right? Yeah. So it's designed mainly for multiply and accumulate operations to accelerate machine learning because they want to sell these chips, right? 
yeah, I think the other, the other people also want to sell these chips, but uh, Samsung wants to be, I think, uh, I don't know, more AI ML oriented, let's say, but I think they're generalizing it also. Okay, I mean, they also put uh, something like this. This is a bit different. This is a module level, which we may talk about later on. But basically, there's a lot of effort going on in industry finally about this. And as we mentioned, there's FPGA-based processing near memory also. You can do this also. And FPGA can be tightly coupled with high bandwidth memory. This is almost like a 3D stacked system. It's not 3D stacked today. It's 2.5D stacked, meaning there are interposers that connect the FPGA to high bandwidth memory. But essentially, you have very high bandwidth, low latency connections to memory. And I think this can enable, as we show in this paper, acceleration of many interesting applications. Okay, so basically, uh, we have uh, the push from circuits and devices and pull from applications. That's why I think this intelligent controllers is good to examine. But I think we also need to think differently from the past approaches to enable this. And that's what these lectures are going to be more about. Any questions so far? Some of this has been reviewed. Yes, please. Mm, any um... I guess interplay between this and um, secure uh, and security because yeah. it seems like security is like one of those things where you, you don't want to tackle on its own because it's sort of like not that attractive. Um, but maybe if like PIM fundamentally makes security easier, then you can just sell really good PIM chips and and beat the whole security problem. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think uh, as I mentioned, uh, by moving data less, you're probably making it less vulnerable. So I believe there's that aspect that can help security. But of course, I think that requires, uh, what, you, what you suggested requires more examination, right? What are the benefits from a security perspective that processing in memory brings? And can we take advantage of it in real systems? I agree. I think uh, uh, there are good reasons to do PIM. I think security can, alone cannot be a reason, probably. But security can be enhanced by the use of PIM. Okay, very good point. Okay, so let's uh, now let's jump into two directions. Uh, so uh, I think you will read this paper, but uh, we categorize processing in memory into two approaches. These are two fundamentally different approaches. And maybe there's a third approach that I don't know of. If you find something, let me know. These are two broad categories. One is called processing using memory. The other is called processing near memory. And enabling technologies could be very different. I'm not going to go into enabled technologies right now, but in general, processing using memory uh, refers to uh, the fact that uh, you, can, uh, you can use the analog operational properties of a storage device or a memory device to also perform computation. So remember, DRAM does data storage, right? If you think about it, okay, it's designed for storage. Yes, absolutely, no question about that. But some properties of the DRAM array and the circuitry, in particular charge sharing, can enable us to move data around efficiently and also can enable us to do computation. And I'm going to show you. Basically, even inside a, a, a device that's stored, a device meaning like this array uh, that's designed for storage, there's some analog, fundamental analog computational capability. And you can exploit that. And this is very different from how we do computation today, right? Today, we design a computation unit that does purely computation. We design memory, it does purely memory. But what we're suggesting is memory can do more than just being memory. It can also do computation. I don't know if the other way is around is true. I think the other way around is true if you think about emerging memory, te emerging technologies. Logic today cannot be used as memory. Well, unless you go to SRAM, right? SRAM is really based on logic, right? You have two cross couple inverters that enable access. So, okay, SRAM, fun, uh, some technologies can also be used as memory a little bit, but uh, yeah. There's also resistive uh, logic technologies that people look at that I'm not going to go into, but they can also be used non-volatile uh, memory and logic at the same time. So I think thinking about this is very interesting, basically. Can memory do some operations without adding logic to it or without adding much logic to it? And I think that's processing using memory. That's what processing using memory is. Does that make sense? So that requires a fundamentally different way of thinking, I think. That's why I think processing using memory is harder to adopt in general, but it could be also a much more powerful Meaning now you have these huge memory arrays and all of them in parallel can be doing operations on data that they store without adding any logic. We'll see that. And I think this is interesting. Without adding any logic, take it uh, with a grain of salt because we may need to add some logic to make it easier. Right? Uh, but without adding, for example, complicated adders uh, or any gates, let's say. 
Processing near memory is more conventional. Basically, uh, you have uh, you have processor today and you have memory today. They're far away. Memory is here. Processor gets closer and 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 closer, and closer to memory. And there are different, clearly different levels of processing near memory, right? Today, they're far away. In another uh, technology, maybe just like upmem, right? The processor can be right next to the DRAM bank. In some other technology, if you're 3D stacked, the processor may be underneath memory, right? Or if you're monolithically 3D stacked, like you can actually arbitrarily mix memory and logic, you can be you can have memory logic, memory logic, memory logic. Does that make sense? So there are levels of processing near memory also. Today we're far away. You can processing inside the memory controller. That is processing near memory, right? You're nearer to memory compared to where you are today from a computation perspective. So from that perspective, processing near memory is, uh, let's say, more traditional. Uh, it doesn't really uh, break a lot in terms of how we design algorithms. We can use the same algorithms. We can use the same software. We just need to figure out what should be done near memory, right? Or what benefits from being done near memory. So that's why I think these two are fundamentally different approaches, and we're going to cover both. Today, I would like to try to cover crossing using memory as much as possible, but let's see how much we can go. OK. OK, that's not working because I turned it off for some reason. OK. So OK, uh, as I mentioned, processing using memory takes advantage of the operational principles uh, of memory to perform data movement and computation inside memory. Usually, this is done in bulk because memory operates in bulk, right? Remember the robo granularity? you do operation on an entire row internally. Of course, we can take out stuff from the row and do operations inside it, but now that becomes processing near memory, right? Because you add, you're adding logic to whatever you pull out from memory, uh, to, uh, to operate on whatever you pull out from memory. But basically, we're going to try to exploit internal connectivity in this memory array to move data, and we're going to exploit analog computation capability. And actually, I believe all memory te technologies have this potential. You just need to figure out how to do this. And we, I'm going to talk a lot about DRAM, but people have shown that this is doable in emerging memory technologies. Similar things like with what we're going to talk about. People have shown that this is doable in flash memory. Maybe a little bit different from what I'm going to talk about, but there are ways of taking advantage of the storage array to actually do computation also. So I'm going to give examples. We're going to talk about row clone first. So we're going to start simple. We're not even going to do computation. We're going to talk about data copy and initialization which is clearly important in systems. Uh, basically, you have a source page, you copy to the destination page, or you initialize uh, some huge amounts of memory, right? So if you're initializing a huge one terabyte database, it takes some time today because you have to write the values to the entire physical memory. So can we do that better today? And it's actually interesting. If you're interested in this, people talk about this sort of issues like bulk data copy initialization because operating systems do that a lot, right? Whenever you... Uh, deallocate a page, you need to zero it for security and privacy purposes. Some languages actually require it. Uh, and that takes time, basically. And people have written papers saying, oh, we need more support from architecture to enable this. Uh, yeah, this is why systems are not getting faster, for example, uh, because we don't have support. Even though the hardware is getting faster, they're not uh, supporting the primitives uh, that we need in systems. And copy and initialization always comes up in these works. And people actually provide this hardware support, but they do it in a near memory processing manner, meaning they put the support in the memory controller. Uh, and there's more you can read. OK, so this is important for many applications, actually. Uh, like I, I mentioned this, but there are many, many reasons why you want to copy pages. For example, if you clone a virtual machine, at some point, you need to copy the pages. And that copying takes a long time. And this is actually interesting. I'm, uh, I spent some time at VMware. and people were quite preoccupied with writing software that tries to do zero copy as much as possible. So you try to make, you make the software very complex so that you minimize the copying that goes on because copying is expensive, no question about that. And then the result is your software becomes unreadable. You look at the software, I have no idea. You could have written it just with a copy, right? Why, why do they go through all of those hoops? Because copies are expensive basically. And I mean, as a, as a virtual machine infrastructure company, you should make copies cheap, right? You don't want your virtual machines to be launching uh, in one minute. That takes, that's a bit too long. 
Okay, so there's a lot of evidence also. Uh, this Google paper that I mentioned earlier that analyzes their application in their data center, they basically said these two function calls only, mem1 and mem copy, occupy about 5% of the cycles, are responsible for 5% of the execution cycles in all uh, work goals that they examine in their data center. That's a lot, I would say. Just two function calls are responsible for 5% of your cycles. Then there must be something wrong with those function calls. Okay, so okay, how do we do a copy today? Uh, well, today we're processor centric, right? Uh, if you want to copy one page to another page, we have to go through the processor, right? You bring the source page byte by byte or load by load into the L1 cache. You bring the destination page load by load into the L1 cache, do the copy and write back the destination. Clearly, this is high latency because you do many memory accesses. High bandwidth utilization on perhaps the most important resource we have, memory bus. Cache pollution, because you actually go through the caches to actually do this. But now people, uh, not people, the processors have support that for direct memory access engine. So you can set up the memory controller to do this copy. By avoid, uh, and the, the benefit that gives is clearly it avoids the polluting the cache hierarchy. But of course, it doesn't get rid of the memory bus bottleneck, right? So you could actually reduce the overhead of copies by doing it through the memory controller. Okay. And it still calls unwanted data moment because Maybe you don't want to bring any of the destination page because you're not going to use it, right? So initialization is a special case of copy. You're initializing, let's say, one terabyte again, my favorite example. Why do you bring all of that to the processor, right? Clearly, your processor is not going to uh, use all of those one, ter one terabytes anytime soon. But everything has to go through the processor. Right? Okay, so these are some numbers. These numbers can change, but four kilobyte page copy via direct memory access engine, meaning going through the memory controller only takes about 1,000 nanoseconds and 3.6 microjoules with some DDR3 technology. It doesn't change that much. If you do the calculations with today's technology, you'll see something similar, basically. OK. So the question is, can we do better? And this is the processor-centric view, right? Everything has to go through the processor. If you take a more data-centric view, you say, I want to be able to have the option where I could do just this. Internally inside the memory, I do the copy, and nothing else in the system gets disturbed. It sounds like a reasonable thing to ask, right? I just want to have the option. I'm not suggesting you should always do this. Maybe there are cases where you should be doing it in the processor because you're going to reuse the data, et cetera. But at least have, let us have the option. And clearly, this is low latency. I'm going to show you some results. Uh, and then this is low bandwidth utilization because you're not using the data bus at all. Uh, no cache pollution, but you could eliminate that through the direct memory access. So direct memory access actually solves that problem, but nothing else. And no unwanted data movement. You bring the data into the chip only when it's really needed, right? That's the idea. So I'm going to show you a mechanism in its fastest but unoptimized version, reduces this 1,000 nanoseconds to 90 nanoseconds, and this 3.6 microjoules to 0 0.04 microjoules. And again, the idea will be processing using memory. So memory is actually very much capable of doing this easily. And let's see. Remember the structure of memory? You have a subarray with many rows, and you have the row buffer, send some fires. We're going to take advantage of that. This is DRAM. But non volatile memory chips, people also evaluated this, and they show that you can do it, uh, at least in simulation. Uh, OK, so let's say we want to copy a source row over here to a destination row in the same subway. They share the send some fires, which is the row buffer. So we first activate. The idea is to first activate the source row, which brings the data into the row buffer. Now, row buffer has the data strong. Row buffer has big transistors, so it's very strong. Uh, it has the data reliably stored. Now, the proposal is next to activate row B, which is the destination row. So what do you do? how do you do this? First, you deactivate row A, and then connect row B to the row buffer, meaning that the data from the row buffer gets copied directly into row B. That's the idea, basically. It's very simple. Two consecutive activates. Activate row A, and then activate row B while deactivating row A, and use the row buffer as a temporary storage to store row A's contents so that you can transfer them to row B. And this is really easy to do with negligible hardware costs. Basically, if it's very little hardware cost to make sure this happens, you can read the paper for more detail. But more recently, papers have shown that you could actually do it in existing DRAM chips off the shelf. Buy a DRAM chip, modify your memory controller such that you mimic two consecutive activates, and you get a row clone effect. Not always. In a reasonable number of chips, a fraction of chips, 
But this shows that DRAM chips are fundamentally capable of doing this. If you get it in even just one DRAM chip, you have a proof of concept. But these folks show that actually you can get it in many DRAM chips. So even though DRAM chips are not designed to do this copy reliably, you can perform this copy reliably in some DRAM chips. That shows basically, that's a proof of concept basically showing that you can actually do this processing using memory, at least data moment using memory and existing DRAM chips. So imagine now what you could do, you could actually design this reliably and make sure this works in the design as opposed to uh, someone hacking the memory controller and reducing the memory latency such that you mimic uh, consecutive, two consecutive activates. Right. Yes. You mentioned, it's a question of that because I heard the same thing in the seminar already, right? Yes. You mentioned uh, both times that you need to deactivate A first before activating B. Why? Oh, uh, we're going to go into it more maybe. But uh, so basically, because you, uh, you cannot drive. Uh, so deactivating means if, if a row is activated, it's connected to the bit lines, right? If two rows are connected to the bit lines, I guess you don't technically have to deactivate B. You're right. Because the sense amplifier is so strong that its data will be driven into both rows. But uh, there is a practical reason. Uh, you don't want to have multiple decoders, row decoders. So if you want to actually drive two word lines concurrently, both of them need to be enabled, which means that technically you need to have two decoders. Right? And that's expensive in the year. Yes. Um, maybe I'm, I'm reading the graphic here wrong, but why is the data bus only 8-bit? Bit oh, wide? ignore that part. <laughs> but yes, this is, how, this is how it is in existing DRAM chips, basically. Uh, to go to the outside of the DRAM chip, it's a narrow interface. We're going to talk more about it. Uh, because this is off-chip, meaning this is pins. This is real pins, and pins are huge on a chip. And it's expensive. Make sense? Yeah, we're going to see that more. Basically, that's true for the processor chip also. If you look at the processor chip, the data buses are 64 bits, very small. DRAM chips are even more cost sensitive. And there's a lot more, let's say, analog stuff going on internally. So not all DRAM chips have data buses that are 8 bits. Some of them have 16 bits. Some of them have 32 bits. But in the end, you're pin limited. So it cannot be 8,000 bits or 4 kilobytes, let's say. I mean, I guess it's not important for this picture. <laughs> oh, okay. I, uh, so I think we're kind of abstracting away things. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the DRAM hierarchy and how it's organized. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're, we're abstracting away some things over there. Yes. Is there also a solution for the situation where you're not copying exactly the size of a row? Yeah, like so <laughs> three kilobytes. Yeah, I think we can discuss that, but not in this particular case. In this particular case, this is the fastest way, but because the ERAM is row granularity, it's very hard to reduce the granularity. Of course, you can add more logic, but then that goes against your purpose, right? You can add some, add some masking logic before you write the data back. Yeah, <laughs> that's expensive. Not in this particular copy mechanism. There are some other copy mechanisms so within a subarray, I think it's difficult. But if you want to copy from one bank to another bank, that could be at the granularity of, let's say, 64 bits, whatever that bus is internally. That's a good question, basically. That's one of the limitations of this, actually. The copy has to be at the granularity of a DRAM row. And the paper discusses that, actually. But I think you can deal with it in some way because it's so fast, right? OK, so basically, the latency reduction is more than 11x. and the Memory energy reduction is 70, more than 70x. Yes. So I know they didn't do it here, but why is it not trivial to simply, for a selective copy, to simply pre-charge the rows, uh, the columns you do not want to copy? This should be easy to implement, right? Yeah, but then uh, you need additional logic to selective pre-charge, right? So you need to select which columns and, <laughs> yeah. Selective pre-charge is not easy. <laughs> And then the question becomes, what else do you write to the other parts of the column, right? Then, yeah, there are multiple issues over there, but select, I think the cost is the biggest limiter there. You could do it basically in the end if you can, if you can uh, design that circuitry. Maybe it's something to think about. Okay. Okay. So, why does this work? Basically, uh, I think uh, based on the chart sharing, basically, we're exploiting the analog operational principles of memory, which is a chart sharing principle. So let's take a look at that a little bit. 
So I'm uh, right now, this is row granularity. I'm going to take one bit from each row and the sense amplifier. Source row, destination row, and the sense amplifier. And they're connected via the bit line, right? Imagine this being this entire row, but we're looking at only one bit. Let's say the source row is VDD, charged state initially, the capacitor. Destination row is not charged. And to be able to do sensing and charge sharing in DRAM, your bit lines need to be pre-charged, meaning it has to be at a reference voltage, VDD over two in this case. And you can see that sense amplifier is not enabled here, meaning both sides are VDD over two. This is the pre-charged state, basically. Now, let's take a look at what happens. We're going to activate source row, which essentially connects the capacitor to the bit line. Now we have a charge sharing process because the voltage here is much higher than the voltage here. Based on charge sharing, there's some perturbation. And that perturbation uh, causes this VDD over two to go up a little bit. Sense amplifier gets enabled, senses this, and amplifies it such that the bit line is the value of what the source was, and the other side of the sense amplifier is the opposite value, clearly, right? Okay, now we've sensed what's in source. We have the correct value in the bit line. Now, what also happens is restoration. Basically, sense amplifier is strong. Now, this is VDD. This is some much smaller value. And because sense amplifier is very strong and cells are small, this gets filled with VDD also. And that's the end of the reading, let's say, activation process. It consists of charge sharing, sense amplification, and restoration. So you restore the value back. And this is why DRAM read is destructive. When people say DRAM read is destructive, because of charge sharing, you lose the charge first, and then sense amplifier gets, gets it restored back. Okay, so this is good. This is a normal read process. I activated the source row. I know the value. Now, what are we going to do next? We're going to deactivate the source row which doesn't change anything in the system, except source row is not connected anymore. Now, we're going to activate the destination row, which means that we connect the capacitor to the bit line, and the bit line is already VDD. There's no sensing that's going to happen. There's charge sharing that's going to happen, because this is very high charge, and this is strong. The data gets copied here. Again, this is charge sharing, pure charge sharing, basically, where charge flows, right? And that's how the data gets copied, and then you can deactivate the destination row also. Now, source destination has the value of the source. You can do the same thing for zero value start also. Okay, that's the idea. Makes sense, right? Okay, I think we already discussed this. I've already given you the idea. Okay, so this is the fastest mechanism. Source and destination are in the same subarrays. But if you look at a DRAM chip, it's more complicated than just subarrays, right? This is banks, multiple banks for parallelism. We will also discuss that later on. And there's a shared internal bus. And then uh, each bank has multiple subarrays. Uh, I've given you how to do this inside the subarrays. Let's take a look at what happens between banks. So this is where the granularity can be smaller. So there's a shared internal bus that's 64-bit granularity. I've just made it up. Usually it's 64-bit, but it could depend on the DRAM chip, of course. Basically, if you want to copy three 64-bit entities, you can do it easily. Just like this. <laughs> it's magic, right? No, it's not, it's not magic because today we can read from a bank send it to the memory channel, 64 bits, or whatever that bit is. It could be eight bits, actually. Internally, it could be larger, actually, here. But then externally, it could be less because this is outside the chip. Uh, instead of sending it over here, we're going to send it over here. And we set this bank to the write mode. And we know how to write to a bank. Normally, a bank gets the value from here and gets it written. Basically, we're just using the read and write capability of the banks, just connecting them differently. Set this to read mode, set this to write mode, and memory controller says, do it three times in a pipeline way. The idea. This way you can actually overlap the latency of the read and write. And if you're doing it for the entire four kilobytes or whatever the row size is, uh, your latency reduces by about, let's say two X compared to going through the memory channel. Uh, again, the DMA engine and energy reduces 3.2 X. So it's quite good. Not as good as doing it inside the same subarray, right? Inside the same subarray, you're not moving the data as much. Subarray is here. You're moving data this much in turn. Here, you're moving data across this shared internal bus. Okay. So this is generalized row clone, basically. If you want to do the copy inside the subarray, you can do two consecutive activations. If you want to do it across the banks, you can do, as I described, through the shared internal bus. If you want to do it uh, across subarrays in the same bank, well, you're out of luck. 
because there is no way you, these things are connected to each other in a nice way. So what we propose in this work is actually to use interbank copy twice. If you want to copy one row from here to another row, or arbitrary number of bits, uh, bytes, let's say, at the granularity, or uh, times the granularity of the shared internal bus, you basically go through, the, write it to one bank. Uh, this, uh, there is a temporary dummy row, and you write the, this row to the dummy row in another bank, and then you copy that row, that dummy row, to the subarray over here. And this is a problem because DRAM doesn't have enough connectivity between subarrays inside a bank. That's the reason. But we're going to fix that also. So you can fix it. Yes. So the uh, in some of the papers that I look through, um, there's a global row buffer within a bank, right? Or yeah, also yeah. called a I.O. buffer here. Yeah. Which is that nice connection that we would like to have between subarrays. Yes, yes, exactly. No? And we're going to talk. Uh, that's basically an improvement over this work. Yes. So there's some other row buffer over here, uh, which is around the bank I.O. basically, uh, that you can also use, certainly. OK, that's a good point. But all of this, in this actually particular work, is very little area cost. Because DRAM is already capable of almost all of this. You're just changing, uh, slightly changing how you do things. DRAM is already capable of uh, doing re activates, reads, and writes. You're just orchestrating those so that you can do data copies. OK, and this is the benefit, basically. It's a lot. Uh, but interbank and intrasubarray are actually lower. But ignore these numbers, because later works have improved this significantly. OK, so I said uh, copy and initialization. But initialization is a special case of copyright. You can initialize a row, and then you can copy it to other rows. That's why initialization and copy are essentially the same thing from my perspective. But it's zero initialization is very common in systems. As I said, some languages require data structures to be initialized to all zeros. Some operating systems want uh, uh, pages to be initialized to zeros uh, so that you don't leak information right after the allocation. Uh, so you can fix a row at zero with some hardware overhead, and then copy from that row to other rows using intra subarray copy, right? So fastest way. And if you want to initialize with arbitrary data, you can initialize one row and copy data to other rows, of course. Of course, initializing one row will take some time. Uh, okay, but this also leads to significant energy and latency reductions, as you can see. And this is a summary of the benefits in this particular work, at least. So intra subarray is the best, as you can see. And initialization also happens, uh, zero initialization also happens intra subarray. Basically, as you go out and out of the chip, uh, 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 basically, as the distance between source row and the destination row grows, your benefits also reduce. That's the idea. This is kind of expected, right? And once you go out of the memory controller, both of them are 1.0, meaning that's the baseline. <laughs> First, there's some system level evaluation that I'm not going to talk about, but certainly there are workloads that are copy initialization intensive, and you can gain a lot of benefits on those workloads. And you can see uh, some of those workloads over here. And the paper shows benefits in simulation in these workloads. OK, so OK, this is interesting, clearly. Now you have copy initialization support in DRAM, but how do you actually enable this in a real system? Yes. Are they so this is uh, simulation. So they have been ex uh, observed in simulation experiments. But more recently, we also did some experiments uh, with, uh, with real DRAM chips, like I mentioned. You modify the memory controller such that you imitate Roquan and even in real DRAM chips, we observe them experimentally. Sometimes even higher benefits than what we actually showed because there are some additional overheads in a, that you see in a real system when you do copies. Okay, so that's a very good question. To enable these benefits, you really need an end-to-end -end system design. So applications should be able to communicate block copy initialization across layers. So you may need to change the instruction set architecture to enable this. Or instruction set architecture already provides this. Actually, x86 is very nice. It provides this. Mem copy. I mean, it's not called mem copy in x86, but you can do mem copy in x86 today uh, with single instruction. Uh, how do you ensure crash coherence? Meaning you're copying data inside DRAM, but there are caches that may house some parts of that data. How do you handle that? I think that's always a hairy issue when you're doing computation in different places and the data exists in different places. Cached. This paper talks about doing it through the direct memory access engine, just like you're doing today, and. I think I guess it's the simplest solution, but that may not be the highest performance. How do you maximize the latency and energy savings? 
Remember that the copies are asymmetric, right? Benefits are asymmetric. If source and destination are in the same subarray, the savings are the highest. So you can imagine a system design where the operating system, uh, whenever you're allocating a destination page that's going to be copied from the source page, operating system allocates the destination page from the same subarray. That would be nice, right? Of course, today's operating systems, as we discussed in earlier lectures, have no visibility into the topology of DRAM. So they have no idea what the DRAM structure looks like. They don't know where the subarrays are. So this idea, of course, requires either good reverse engineering and then feeding that information to the operating system or good interfaces such that the DRAM provides its topology to the operating system and the operating system can actually do this nicely. I believe the good interface is important. So we really need to break that. There's a huge gap between the operating system or system software, as well as the hardware today. System software actually knows some things about the hardware, but it doesn't know enough, especially in these memory allocation related stuff. For example, we were talking about turning off refreshes, right? For unallocated portions. That information doesn't get communicated to the hardware. Here, the hardware's topology doesn't get communicated to the software. As a result, there is a huge lack of communication that leads to a lot of inefficiency in systems. And these ideas also suffer in the end. Okay, how do you handle data reuse? Again, Meaning, if you copy a page to another page and the destination page is actually going to be reused soon, what do you do about it? Do you actually do the copy inside DM? Do you actually do the copy inside the processor? Or do you do something inside DM and actually send the data, necessary data to the processor? So there are a lot of interesting questions over here. I'm not going to tackle that, but this paper tackles some of them. Okay, I don't know why. Okay. But yeah, if you're interested in row clone more, uh, and if you want to prefetch part of the later lectures, uh, which are going to happen later, you can read uh, or you can listen to the seminar, which is a seminar you were talking about and you were in. If you're taking the seminar course, it's a bit boring, sorry. But now you can ask advanced questions because we already covered the Roku as a paper review in the seminar course. Okay, but I think the mindset here is now memory can do some, I don't want to call this computation because it's not computation, but also uh, we're going through the processor for it and processor is supposed to do computation, right? Uh-oh, my Mac will sleep soon. That doesn't sound good. I guess let's see what happens. <laughs> We're almost at the end also. Can, yeah, can you give it to me? Yeah, that sounds like urgent right now. It was exciting, you think so? <laughs> oh, there's a question on Zoom. Let's see if this will work. If it doesn't work, then... Yeah, you like running uh, at the margins, huh? <laughs> Maybe I like... Okay, it worked, I think. Yesterday, it didn't work. I don't know why. Okay, should we answer the question on Zoom? Question about in-memory copy. Won't we still need some sort of communication with the caches to ensure coherency? Yeah, I think this is what we mentioned, yes. Basically, yes, uh, if, if the destination row or is partially in the cache, or even if the source row is partially in the cache and updated in the cache, you still need to get the up-to-date value, right? So yes, you need to flush the source row and the destination row inside into the memory so that you can actually do the copy, which is what the DMA engines today do actually. If you want to do this copy through the DMA engine, the DMA engine automatically does that coherence mechanism, which is not nice. I think there are some other mechanisms that you can implement like some of the other papers we may talk about. I don't know if we'll get to it. Like there are simpler coherence mechanisms that you can propose for near data processing and processing in memory. But that's, yeah, that's something you have to do. Yeah, or don't cache the data. <laughs> okay, but I think the mindset here is memory can do some computation and thinking of memory as an accelerator. Memory has this capability to do data movement and initialization nicely like this. Why not take advantage of it, right? We're designing all of these accelerators and computation is free, remember? And all of these accelerators are bottlenecked by the memory system. Why not have some accelerators over here that are not bottlenecked by the memory system? It's a, in a sense, it's a no brainer. But it also requires a mindset uh, change, let's say, such that you can have more data-centric accelerators. I would call these as more compute-centric accelerators, whereas these are more data-centric accelerators. We will talk more about this. But I think programming issues are going to be similar. Okay, let's talk about row clone a little bit, and then I think we're going to conclude before we can go into uh, other types of computation. Since I already uh, talked about this in the seminar course, I'll talk about the strengths and the weaknesses also. So this is, uh, I think very quickly, this is a simple new way of solving an important problem. I think the problem is important, effective and low overhead. I think it's intuitive. I think it's nice actually, it's greatly improves performance efficiently, assuming your data is mapped nicely, right? 
if you can use this subarray level, intra subarray low row clone. And I think, uh, regardless of the data mapping, this seems like a clear win for initialization, right? Because you're initializing huge amounts of data, uh, you're wasting a lot of time and energy. Why not just do it inside the memory, right? And I think uh, this is this goes back to my comment about VMware, for example. It makes software designers' life easier. If copies are 10x to 100x cheaper, 10x in terms of performance, close to 100x in terms of energy, how do you design software? Do you really need to spend so much effort to actually get rid of copies as much as possible and make your software a lot harder to maintain and read? So there's a. I think this is a trade-off between the performance and productivity, say. To get performance, you're reducing productivity in software. But if you have a mechanism like this, I think you can get both performance and productivity potential. And I think paper is, I would recommend reading the paper. Uh, I don't remember if we're going to assign it yet in the earlier homework. Probably not. We're going to assign it in the next homework as one of the potential papers. But there are many low level and system level issues the paper tackles. Okay, and I like the paper. <laughs> but you can, you can pass your own judgment when you review the paper. <laughs> okay, there are also weaknesses. We, uh, basically, this requires data to be mapped in the same subarray to deliver the largest benefits, as some of you mentioned. Uh, and also, the granularity is large. And it helps less if data movement is not within a subarray. So to really take advantage of it, you need to be subarray aware, let's say, in the system. And it certainly doesn't help if the data movement is across the EM channels, right? The idea is not solving that problem. But there are cases where data movement may happen across the memory channels if your data is really mapped not nicely, right? You may have 10 memory channels and you're moving from one to the other. Or even the, across these different chips, right? Uh, meaning across different DM channels from different processor chips, from different memory controller chips. Interest of copy is very inefficient, as we discussed, and caused many changes in the system stack that could be difficult for adoption. It's an end-to-end -end design that spans applications all the way to circuits. It's an example of the cross-layer approach that we've been discussing, right? I like it, but certainly this makes it harder to adopt also. Yeah, as I said. And cache coherence and data reuse cause real overheads, as some of you mentioned. And I think this goes back to some of the comments. Evaluation is done only in simulation and doesn't consider multiple things. Yeah, now you can go to the rat holes over here. <laughs> Basically, if you analyze a paper, right, recognize why you're going into the rat holes. When you start talking about evaluation, unless there's something fundamentally flawed in the evaluation, probably you're going into a lot of rat holes. But I think it's good to still talk about them, but maybe move on very quickly. Maybe, are, maybe there are better workloads, actually. I don't think we have conveyed uh, the benefits of this idea really well with just these workloads. We should have had those Google workloads, right? Okay, uh, so maybe let's quickly cover the improvements over Rocon, and then we're going to stop. But basically, there are many questions this raises, right? Can we do faster interest of a copy? And the answer is yes. I'm going to briefly mention this. Can we enable data movement at smaller granularities within a bank? And more recently, we've actually figured out how to do this, as uh, one of your colleagues mentioned, right? You can use a global uh, row buffer inside the bank to enable this. Can you do better interbank copy? If you actually have 3D stack memories and logic layer, you can actually copy data much nicely by having a network between the banks. Of course, more higher cost, but you could do it. Can, you, can similar ideas and DRAM properties be used to perform computation on data? And the answer is yes also, meaning you can do and or not. And you can essentially have a functionally complete system. I'm not going to be able to talk about that uh, because we need to finish soon, but uh, this is going to be the subject of the beginning of the next lecture. And I think this is fascinating. You cannot just do copy initialization, but you can also do and or not. Let me give you the idea of this increasing connectivity in DRAM because I think this directly builds on row clone and it tackles the same problem. So you have these subarrays, it's, it's a nicer animation. You have a bank divided into subarrays and some numbers over here. And there's an internal data bus, both between the banks as, uh, as well as you can imagine inside the, uh, between the subarrays, but you have to go through the global thing over here, uh, global robot for over here. But basically there's no connectivity between the subarrays. There's at least low connectivity between the subarrays and that causes uh, bottlenecks for block data movements. That's why your clone is not efficient between subarrays, for example. That's true for also banks, right? There's low connectivity between the banks, so your clone is also not efficient. So this paper tackles the, subarray connectivity problem. Basically, it wants to provide a new substrate to enable wide connectivity between the subarrays. And the idea is very simple, basically. It's called low-cost interlinked subarrays. And it basically, there's a wide data path of isolation transistors that connect the edges of the subarrays. Let's take a look at this. I'm abstracting subarray one and subarray two. 
And this is what we had. These are called isolation transistors. Basically, if you enable them, you can think of the bit line as being extended to the next subarray. Right? Remember the bit line? The bit line gets connected to the next subarray so that you can move data from one row in subarray one to the sense amplifiers of the next subarray, meaning row buffer of the next subarray. Of course, you could do this arbitrarily long, right? You could connect the next subarray with another isolation transistor. But of course, now your interconnects are becoming longer and longer. So I think it's a nice idea to enable connections, more connectivity. And the paper also shows that. I'm not going to talk about this in detail. I'll give you some key results. It turns out this is beneficial for not just this reason. So this interconnectivity is good for clearly moving data between the subarrays. And you can see uh, copy latency improves by 9x, which is, let's say, close enough to do it within a subarray, right? Within a subarray, you remember, it was 11.6x improvement. This is 9.2x. Not bad. And you can see these, where these numbers are coming from. You need to read the paper. Uh, you can also do some interesting things in the DRAM microarchitecture. You can say, for example, subarray two is much faster. How do you make it much faster? It's much smaller, let's say. The interconnects are uh, shorter. I'm going to use subarray two as a cache. And I dynamically put things inside this cache uh, that I use more frequently, more often, or more recently. So inside the DRAM, you can build a cache for hot data. And uh, this, uh, th this is how you move the data into the cache space. Otherwise, there is no easy way of moving the data into the cache. So if, if you have heterogeneous subways, some of them are faster, some of them are slower, this interconnection mechanism enables movement of data into that cache, hot data. And you can see there's some speed up, et cetera. And also, finally, the pre-charging. Pre-charging is really setting the bit line to VDD over two. That turns out to be long latency because it's I mean, for various reasons, because it takes time to actually stabilize the circuit to VDD over two. So you have a special pre-charge unit in general in DRAM or in other technologies also. You have a special unit that pre-charges the bit line so that it can be sensed in the next activation. Now it turns out each subarray has a pre-charge unit. If you connect the subarrays this way, you can use the pre-charge units of both subarrays to pre-charge a single bit line. That actually reduces the pre-charge latency significantly, as you can see. 2.6x. So I think it's, a, it's very interesting to think about this connectivity in DRAM. I believe there's more to do actually in connectivity in DRAM. Uh, we need to think about how we really connect inside a memory chip uh, so that we can actually do the data movement and computation better. Okay, if you're interested, there's paper on this. I'm not going to go through these papers, uh, but I think the mindset is really, once you think of memory as an accelerator for certain operations, why not make that accelerator even better? And what it does basically, right? And that's the idea. And then you keep pushing and pushing, and then an accelerator becomes really, really good at what it does. Okay, I think this is uh, where we will probably stop. But next time, we're going to cover real computation. So far, what I've told you is processing using DRAM for data movement and uh, initialization. That's not real computation, even though they're just as real. Some reviewer would say perhaps. Oh, this is not real, right? <laughs> it's not real computation. I'll reject it. But data copy initialization is clearly real, but yes, I wouldn't call that computation, right? So we're going to talk about how to do and or, how to do not, how to do block bitwise execution, and how to actually try to make it even more programmable going into the future. And we're going to talk about some of the other extensions work, extensions of it also. Okay, actually, maybe before we uh, leave, this is a slide related to Oakland and also basically. Can this be valid on a real system? Yes, actually. Similar ideas can be used on other types of memories also. And charge sharing properties can be used for other functions also. And we will see that as the lectures progress. So this is probably a good place to stop. If you're interested in reading, these are some of the papers. Okay. So let's stop here. And I'm going to stop sharing. I guess I'll see you next week. Uh, have a good weekend. Take care.